are now listening to Sanity at the Movies. Quiet Man Edition? Man, I'm really falling down on the editions. They used to be clever. Actually, some might argue. They were never clever, but they used to at least try. They used to at least grab a stick and gesture in the direction of clever. Now, I have to say... a lady that needed beaten. The no, lady that needed beaten. That's right. Now, Jake reminds us that we are talking about John Ford's feminist masterpiece, The Quiet Man. And maybe I'm not even being sarcastic. I might try and make that argument today. Certainly don't think it's as... It's not uh, going to hold up. Well, yeah, we'll get to it. I mean, I, I don't know. I People like to think that this is one of like John Wayne's other movies. But I don't know. This movie's not, really. I would not say that this movie has the same messaging or point or thrust to it as, say, McClintock or Donovan's Reef for one of the John Wayne movies where... Well, I don't know. Maybe it does. I think it kind of does. Well, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Maybe we'll get someplace interesting, but... Uh, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll get to this the same John Wayne shtick. Kind of the proto-John Wayne shtick. Oh, here's a shtick to <clears throat> beat the lovely lady. Be- I, I don't know about proto. I mean, he's like 45 in this He's movie. 45, but this is the first real Maureen O'Hara team up. The first. It's kind of the first John Wayne sex movie, I guess. There's elements of this kind of thing beforehand but mm-hmm. the whole second half of john wayne's career the movies are just going to be about john wayne's a really cool guy and there's a bunch of idiots surrounding him and he just needs to punch them if they're men and spank them if they're women and as long as everyone bows to the will of john wayne then things will be great like that's the second half of john wayne's career going into the 60s but the quiet man predates that anyway We'll talk about it, folks. This is February, of course. It's the month of love. And we like to dig up something that has some feelings and things in it that you don't usually see in modern Hollywood. And so we did the Philadelphia story. And a lot of people thanked us for doing that one. And that movie's about as aggro as they come. Again, I might even argue more aggro than this one. And then... It does not feature the image, the triggering image of Cary Grant doesn't actually drag Catherine Hara across the field or Catherine whatever. Catherine Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn, yes. Catherine O'Hara. Yeah, the bomb from Home Alone. <laughs> <laughs> that I would like to see. Good thing he doesn't. Yes. <coughs> Cary Grant, old man Cary Grant dragging the bomb from Home Alone. I don't know why Home Alone 2 didn't feature that. Anyway, and then we did a movie that was pretty aggro, but that Jake argued was actually more... Eye candy for the ladies, as I recall. The Muchma. Clark Gable. It happened one night. It happened one oh, yeah. night. It was Frank Capra. Yeah. Almost like the romance novel, the Harlequin romance version, as Jake mm-hmm. argued, of that kind of man woman dynamic, like a little bit cartoonish. But that was a fun episode. You can go listen to it. One of our, not disagreements, but just an interesting discussion it was triggered. Anyway, we decided. W- in the annals of things that are playing with sex and mm. submission and all this kind of stuff, The Quiet Man came next. So happy February. We're also doing Clueless. In fact, I think we already did it. So although I don't remember exactly the scheduling. So we, we definitely, in our timeline, already did it. I just don't know whether we already did it in your timeline. Whether we released it. Or not. But we're doing The Quiet Man from 1952, classic John Ford film. Gentlemen, what is your baggage regarding The Quiet Man? I knew it existed. I'd never seen it. But you do beat your wife with a stick anytime she leaves you in there town. There is no wife beating. Well, the, there's some aggression. But there's no, aggression, but yeah. But there's no proper beating in this one. In this film, yes. She does, she does beat him or try to. Yes. She slaps him or something. Mm -hmm. But he blocks it, I think. He kicks her in the caboose. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. I could imagine that if someone was... Definitely throws her around, grabs her hair. If Uh someone was triggered by such things, I would not say that this movie would not be triggering. Triggering. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, just people think of this movie in the same way that McClintock... Yes, I don't know how many times I've said, oh, I love The Quiet Man, and they say, ha ha, yeah, John Wayne spanks Marino hair. Yeah, wife spanking is what people associate with it but they're just importing mcclintock and he's very aggressive and physical with her but right there's not actual wife spanking no well she's like hey here's a stick to beat me and he's like nope he actually rejects it 
multiple, right. and then she rejects. There, there is actually one scene where he does kind of spank her. It's when she's going back into the house for something. Oh, sure, but that's that's playful. Well, it is, but I'm just saying. Okay, if you're going to be triggered, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, if somebody's triggered by that, then they just hate love. I think <laughs> if someone's triggered by that's love. That's a playful pat on the bottom, right there. She's going back in after sitting in the garden or something like that that's right, right. yeah i mean it I'm has a, it has a little bit of like well that at that point in the movie for our, for reasons there's some aggression there's some that's frustration right. there that's that what i'm saying yeah to say. it's a little bit of like hey don't forget i'm your husband kind of stuff but, <laughs> right but she likes it oh my goodness what a movie what a movie so you've never seen it no you do beat your wife with a stick anytime she leaves you in town in in the carriage and neither confirm nor deny uh, wow okay not gonna deny <laughs> I guess it's, 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 it's if I, if I Harry deny Tru- it, it makes me look bad, like I'm taking it seriously. As Harry Truman <laughs> That's said, what I heard. never denied. Well, I can't say that quote on the podcast. Boy, can I not say that quote on the podcast? <laughs> I thought that was LBJ. Yeah, That's anyway. LBJ. Yeah, it is LBJ. Okay, well, folks, yeah, look it up or don't. I didn't say it. All right, yeah, Jake, your history with the Quiet Man. Now, the Quiet Man's a dad movie. But my dad will never not be my companion. Watching that movie, the moments that he liked, liked or thought were funny or whatever. Or just there. So so there's that. So it's a movie that I sort of grew up with. Although it's not a movie that I ever really paid much attention to. And I haven't seen it in a long time. As a early 20-something newlywed or whatever, I came back to it and enjoyed it and had fun with it. But it's probably been a good 10 or 15 years since I've actually sat down and watched it. Mm-hmm. Maybe longer since I've sat down and watched it straight through. I've got the images and some scenes and stuff in my head and in my mind it's a john ford classic and probably the best john wayne movie ever that's so, sort of how i've classified it so it was interesting to go back and see does that really hold up and why did i think that before i i don't think that's the case yeah well i'm interested to hear why i might agree Anymore. with you i really enjoyed this movie let me say i love it it's a fun time it's a fun movie to watch and it's got a lot of really beautiful scenes and it's shot really well i mean it is in that sense, a John Ford masterpiece for all kinds of just filmmaking reasons. But one of the things I'm going to say, I think, is that part of the appeal is just sort of like Irish nostalgia. And the degree to which that resonates with you is is going to play into your take on the movie. Right, which I can't stand Irish nostalgia. And I like this movie, and I like everything that's Irish about it. Like this version, like I like the whole John Ford world. I like the Calvary movies where everybody's a big family, and the men are getting into fist fights, and the women are like hmm, fist fights. I like. I have nostalgia for John Ford Land, which McClintock is not a John Ford movie, but McClintock is set in John Ford Land. Like just the world of goofy, extend. The whole town is an extended family. You could uh, you could also you could compare it to Capra World or well your main character yeah. is the main character in the town right exactly right like and and everything kind of revolves yeah and Capra around works him. the same way but yes the whole world of the movie and everyone in it unapologetically their lives revolve around your main characters and they are NPCs who jump in and out and have mm-hmm. they bring color right but just like your movie going experience is centered on these two people or this main character the whole movie is in right it's like what does michaelin flynn do exactly he's just a leprechaun that exists to hang out with john wayne and, <laughs> exactly and, right and comment on things and get things done it's like what is his job nobody does <laughs> anything except exists to be something that or somebody that john wayne or marine o'hara plays off of right they are a plot point or a bit of color to bring out some aspect of their character or personality or growth or whatever which from, from my want, vantage point is it. not exactly a criticism it's just a no it's, it's, a, it's an observation of how that style of it's a style works. choice yeah. it's a style of storytelling and that and i think there's something really fun about it and you say the same thing about casablanca it's like everybody comes to it's rick it's everybody everything revolves around ricks and rick a lot of and, stage plays work that way too and you could think of it in terms of, of a stage play where you just don't feel nobody in this movie in the writer's room in the director's seat feels the pressure of pretending like we have to establish independent lives for any of these side characters. That's not the point. And who who cares? That's not where anybody's here to see. Right. And actually it's kind of fun because then we get to sort of participate with the side characters. Like they become 
sort of our avatar in any given moment. They express mm -hmm. your feelings or your thoughts or your excitement or your enthusiasm or your, they, they exist to sort of both signal to you how you're supposed to feel about what's going on and, and put words to it or uh, expression to it. And that's fun. Yeah. I mean, I, as you talk, I'm thinking that style of narrative is actually anchored in the way in a worldview too. It is anchored in like, History books. You read a history book written be before about 1950, and it's a great man theory of history. It's like here, the Civil War is really the story of Abraham Lincoln, and everybody else is a supporting character. The Norman invasion is really the story of William the Conqueror, and everybody else is either a villain or a supporting character. That's how narrative has been told often since the time of Homer, I want to say. Yeah, and you occasionally you'll have somebody who stands athwart that as a matter of purpose and intentionality as a statement like that is uh the genius of tolstoy and the beauty of something like war and peace is yes. like well, that's his part, part of the point the philosophical point of war and peace is great man theory of history is bunk it is stupid nothing works that way but there are a bunch of people mm -hmm. who are living their own lives and are caught up in the scope of history just trying to do their best as they get swept up along with the tide. Right. That's part of the genius of Tolstoy, but that the backdrop of the great man theory of, of history and the way that stories tend to just generally be told, that's the black backdrop that Tolstoy gets to be the little diamond or star right. that sparkles on. Right. Well, and I get so tired of many modern biographies and things like that because they will go out of their way to talk about the sweep, the social sweep of history. And so it'll be like, I just wanted to hear some cool stories about Martin Luther and how cool he was. But instead, it's like, Martin Luther was inevitable. And here's 4,000 reasons why. Well, yeah. And then they overwhelm you with the fact that, okay, well, what you're saying is it's really not possible to know anything about anything. Right. And I don't trust you to at this point, you, what you've told me is there's no way to really judge all the factors. There's so many factors, it's overwhelming. But now you think you're going to synthesize some of them and I'm supposed to give weight to the way that you did? I don't know. I just don't buy it. Like, right. Why don't you just tell me the things about the guy? Yeah, and instead I want the Jimmy Stewart treatment. I want like when Martin Luther was a boy, he wore a blue hat and somehow that influenced the great, greatest things ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you have to hold both things. His mother yeah, didn't like the sweep yeah. <clears throat> plus the guy. Yeah. God uses people. Yeah, well, the other thing in the back of my head is the Bible's kind of written as a great man history, the way right. that it is a both-and thing. <laughs> but the Bible is certainly not above saying, this guy was the king in Israel, he was bad and or good, and that kind of just Changed set, set the tone, of, and yeah. God dealt with them that way. Yep. And it's not like, the corn was bad that year, so the peasants did this, which means the... So, anyway, I find it a breath of fresh air to watch a Capra movie. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of more astute liberal critics hate It's a Wonderful Life or The Quiet Man simply because that form is, in their view, paternalistic, patriarchal. It's like, really? Jimmy Stewart is more important than well, everybody? It is, it is, in fact, patriarchal. And that's what I w was thinking as you're talking about this. Part of the reason that's the dominant frame in scripture is because we have just this basic way that God made the world called federal headship. Right. Original sin, Adam, that matters. Jesus as the second Adam, that matters. And what hits the patriarch and how the patriarch acts affects everybody downstream to the thousandth generation. That all matters. That's how God actually wrote the world. Right. Yeah. So did Tolstoy, for instance, understand that? Or did he downplay that aspect of reality? Well, like Jake said, I think Tolstoy is able to do what he does precisely because he is set against something like he's he's the guy that that says hey wait a second history does its own thing but so you have to hold that in the one hand right yeah and hold federal headship in the other yeah and the bible of course does that the bible of course isn't above mentioning external factors and all of these guys reigns in any case i think one of the things we've dealt with a lot as we've gone back to it's a wonderful life for example is you do have to sort of struggle with whether that movie is a little paternalistic in the way that it views the townsfolk, whether the movie doesn't actually adopt the condescension that Jimmy Stewart feels towards the characters. And you could argue that it does. You could argue that it doesn't, but it's a but discussion worth least, having. Yeah, have the conversation. Yeah. 
And you could say the same thing about The Quiet Man, although I think The Quiet Man is, although I really think you can't because The Quiet Man so anchors itself as almost a fairy tale. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. A, a ritual. Yeah. A bit of <laughs> myth making. I mean, if anything. It's not trying <clears throat> to be anything. Right. Yeah. But that. John Wayne's character is like subordinate to the fairy tale setting. Yes. It's basically like, no, you're stuck here with us now. Right. The story is almost, when are you going to get on board with the fairy tale, That's John right. Wayne? Stop yeah. being a dumb American. Yeah, yeah American. Yeah. Goes to fairyland. Right. That's right. Enters fairy world, has to learn fairy world rules, bucks up against fairy world rules until he finally submits to fairy world rules, in which case, once he's done that, he's able to kill the dragon and get the girl. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the plot. Yeah. And after, he can only refuse the call to adventure for so long. Right. And then you have to submit to the hero's journey and you have to submit to the rules of fairyland. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about it. So let me give a little... Ben, you were going to give a little context on Ireland. Just a little. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So the movie is set in the Irish Free State, which existed from 1922 to 1937. <laughs> and that became today's Republic of Ireland, or Ireland, as we sometimes call it. I, okay. Which is all confusing, because if you know anything about the history of Ireland, it's quite a tangle. And the Irish Free State, which became today's country, or Republic of Ireland, is 26 out of 32 Irish counties. It's most of the island that we also call Ireland, but it's not all of it. The northern part, which is six counties, is Northern Ireland. And that today is part of the UK still, and it's mostly Protestant. That's where the 30-year troubles were. The fights between, it's complicated, you could say, between Catholic and Protestant, but it's also political because it's between those who want a united Ireland that's not under the UK and those who are like, no, we want to be part of the UK. The IRA, their terrorist bombings, their attacks, all that stuff. That's Northern Ireland. The Irish Free State was formed after some revolution and after some civil war. So there was a revolution to get independence and so that the Irish could rule themselves. And then there was a treaty signed with the British that said, sure, you guys can rule yourselves. Just say that you're loyal to the crown. And some of the leaders, like Michael Collins, if you know that name, who was a big time leader of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, said it's like the freedom to get freedom. Like, this is enough to be getting on with. This is the right start, which was not a popular opinion. He was more of a pragmatist. But they still want us to bow the knee. That's right. And he was like, no, we have to do this or we're not going to get anywhere. And he convinced a number of people. But there were a lot of people in the ranks of the Irish Republican Army, which waged guerrilla war against the British. Like, these are not admirable guys, even if you like their goal. (laughs) But they're definitely romanticized in this movie. Yeah, Yeah. Oh, you know, if it was the IRA... Your house would be yeah. burned to the ground by now. I'm going to go talk a little Dana conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. They are, and that reflects that Ireland was... There was a civil war right after they signed this treaty with Britain. And brother turned against brother. If you've seen the movie The Wind That Shakes the Barley, it's mm-hmm. about this time period. It's pretty interesting. It's, it's a brutal movie. I don't... You have to have kind of a stomach for violence if you want to see it. But it does give you a flavor of what Ireland was like in the strife that arose when people who were willing to sign this treaty and be under Britain and people who weren't (laughs) came and (laughs) divided. So the Irish Free State is this relatively peaceful thing after this civil war that exists. And Nathan was saying the other day that he was like, would the Catholic priest in the movie really have gotten along, been a buddy with a Protestant? So all I can tell you (laughs) is that Wikipedia claims, ah, yeah, Sure, could have been. They didn't give me a citation. But Northern Ireland was where you definitely would have had, like, no, the Catholic priests and the Anglican vicar are not going to be friends. Like, they hate each other. They hate each other. Northern Ireland is where there was constantly... They're going to prop each other up. No. Cover your collars yeah. and cheer like Protestants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. It, but the Irish Free State was a little bit more mellow, from what I could tell. And I, again... You're not an Irish historian. I'm just an Irish historian here doing my best, lads. (laughs) It sounded like you're from Fargo, North Dakota. (laughs) (laughs) Might not be an authentic Irish historian. (laughs) So that's basically where we are. We're in Southern Ireland, or what becomes Ireland proper. And now the Republic of Ireland is not part of the UK. They're their own nation. So, But Northern Ireland... Northern Ireland is still part of the UK. Okay. So this area, the Irish Free State, which became the Republic of Ireland, was set loose from the UK eventually. Michael Collins, who was assassinated shortly after persuading his party to sign this treaty, 
I shouldn't say assassinated. He was ambushed and killed. He was proved right. His perspective, his prediction proved true. Yeah, it's just it's one of those things like the Japanese Chinese conflict in the early 20th century where I've seen so many movies that reference these things and Yeah, that's right. Are, Me too. are set. It's very it's, complicated. It's all you know, and some depictions are so romantic on one side or another and it's just all it all gets mixed up in my head. Yeah. The only other thing I want to say is about the IRA itself cuz they started like the Irish Volunteers in 1913 was the seed of the Irish Republican Army which then went through several different incarnations and factions and splinter groups up through the early 2000s. And some of them still exist. Some of these little splinter groups are like, no, we don't accept that Ireland isn't all united as a free Ireland. Hmm. But they are s democratic socialists. So they're downstream of Marx, right? And so they want a republic, but they want a democratic socialist republic. And that's always been what they wanted. And the political party, the political wing of them is still active, still around. It's called Sinn Féin. It doesn't look like that, but that's because we don't know how to pronounce Celtic words. So Sinn Féin. And they have at least a couple seats in the House of... I'm going to get which house it is. wrong. They have some seats anyway in Parliament in Britain Okay, for Northern Ireland. So they're still around, still active. There's still this democratic socialist. Were you telling me yesterday curtain. that they occupy them, but they don't do anything with them? Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's called abstentionism. <laughs> that's what they do. They're like, we're going to win these seats, and we're not going to show up because we're not interested in being part of your governance of us. We're interested in self governance. We're going to win seats, and we're not going to come and vote or come and participate. So that's what you're actually voting Our for. Our seat is an active protest. Our right. seat is an active protest. That's what they do. That's fascinating. It's interesting. And it, like I said, I'm grossly oversimplifying. And listener, if you know more about this than I do, I'm sure I, I got some things wrong. But Well, when the history is the thing, print the... I can't I pull it. What's the quote? What's the John, John Ford's most famous quote? When the history becomes legend, print the legend, Ben. <laughs> so as, All as, right. as we learned from the man who shot Little Brady Ballots... John Ford's last another, great film. Another one I haven't seen. Um, I, I think I'm I think I'm underwatched in John Ford films. That's I think that's what I should say for my baggage. You got across the Ford. Yeah. No, I've I've been getting I've gotten stagecoach and the searchers way back when we first started. That was a John Ford I had never we, seen. We have to come back. Are we coming back to that one this Yeah, I think we're yeah, we are. Yeah. yeah. And now this one. Yeah, I think that's probably the one. I would say, why are we burning through Ford? But we're we're not burning through Ford because there's there's so much twelve thousand of yeah. them. Yeah. I've seen How Green Was My Valley. How Green Was My Valley is his other Irish, or, although that's Celtic. It's, or was, it's that's Welsh. Welsh. Yes, it's that's Welsh. right. Yeah. And completely shot in Hollywood, whereas this movie was shot in Ireland. On location. And looks it. Yeah. And it looks it. <clears throat> well, let me talk very briefly about Ford. I won't spend a lot of time on him because we just talked about him in Stagecoach. Since we had that conversation, The Fablemans has come out, and Steven Spielberg's pretty famous anecdote about his meeting with John Ford forms spoilers the centerpiece of the movie the big climax and which did we ever say i'm sure we did and i'm just an idiot but did we ever say that that was david lynch playing john ford yeah we did i think we okay. did maybe when we okay. did i just couldn't remember if we'd said it yeah fantastic little bit because my brain did a thing where it's like i know who that guy is but i can't separate him from who he's supposed to be playing right now and then like in the car or something right or in the show, Nathan brought it up, and I was like, oh, yeah, duh. Which the story of that is Spielberg called Lynch and said, do you want to do this? And Lynch said, no, no, I'm not an actor. I don't want to do this. And then Spielberg's like, how am I going to get him? So he calls Laura Dern, and Laura Dern, of course, acted in all of Lynch's movies from the very beginning. She's good friends with him. So she talked him into it, and then Lynch calls Spielberg back and says, I'll do it, but only if you send me my outfit weeks in advance so that I can wear it every day. Until I come on set, <laughs> that's which, is, which is just hilarious. a very David Lynch kind of thing to <laughs> well, do. Well, it's that's funny for all kinds of reasons to me personally. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's a magic, it's a magic, and I I think Spielberg magic that I had the moment in the theater of I know who that guy is, but I can't, my brain won't tell me who mm. he is because he's John Ford right now. Right to pull that off with somebody as sort of iconic as David Lynch is just like yeah what happened to my brain that's some movie magic yeah but what's funny about that little bit of david lynch stuff is <coughs> <coughs> that's a good little hack that i uh, gave my son recently 
when he got his first suit. He was he got his first suit and was going to wear it to a dance. He put it on and looked really awkward and uncomfortable. Felt really awkward and uncomfortable with it. And I said, "Well, you've got a week. You're going to put this on every day mm. because it looks great on you. But if you can't sell it as great, if you're not comfortable and not confident." then you're just going to you're going to look awkward and you're going to feel awkward you're going to feel out of place and you won't have fun. So every day 10 15 20 minutes just put the stupid thing on and walk around in it and get used to doing things in it until it feels natural and comfortable. And he did. And he looked great. And it worked. I saw the pictures. That's awesome. Quite I didn't the, see the yeah. pictures. Quite the charmer. I didn't see. Uh, yeah, no. It's it, it is a good hack. And if you're going to wear an eye patch and John Ford had a very iconic look then now, David Flinch is like into transcendental meditation. I'm sure he was like, there was some woo-woo stuff. Yeah, super him. woo-woo, super yeah. method, super weird. Yeah, but in any case, I have watched an interview with Spielberg because I was like, what is the real story? And the way that Spielberg told the story years before The Fablemans was in production is exactly the way that it happens in the movie, down to the lipstick, down to the get the F out of my office. All that stuff is exactly... Now, Spielberg is not above a little myth making and i'm sure he told tells the best version of the story even before it became a movie but that is the version of the story that he tells hmm. and that is very john ford as since we're talking about john ford john ford cultivated an image as a tough guy as a laconic sort of guy that didn't talk a lot that was gruff that was rough he did not allow bad language on his set especially in front of ladies but he is one of those old school kind of guys who with the fellas behind behind closed doors well, he certainly like, wasn't averse to playing with and hinting at it in the context of this movie no no this movie has some stuff that's absolutely impetuous homeric yeah, homeric yes one of my favorite <laughs> lines in cinema same <laughs> say it all the time love it Love it, love it to death. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't remember what that's from. What that uh, is. It's when Micheline walks in and the bed is broken. And oh, he says it. Homeric. <laughs> and then he repeats Homeric in reference to, and I just remember being 14 or 15 and watching that movie and being proud of myself for being able to decipher oh, Homeric yeah. and put all the pieces together. And huh. I, I, that is the reason. It's also one of my favorite lines, but it's just sort of, it's not, just that it's a great line. It's that little moment of revelation at a key point in time where it was also like, oh, there's all kinds of things like these in movies that I can be awake to now. Right. Like that is a relatively more sophisticated double entendre than like a James Bond kind of thing. Right. So it's right. like, so it just like, uh, oh, I, I just got a sophisticated bit of adult humor. I understood yeah, something about sex. I know sex. who Homer I, is. Yeah. I know something about sex now. I know what this whole joke is. And I can... There may be any number of movies and things like that that I can reinterpret and see new layers in. It was like that, I think that m movie, that moment was that, or one of those at least key revelations to me of the sort of layers of adult adult humor and sort of sophisticated humor. Right. Well, and my parents think this is funny. So right. it's like, uh, oh, okay, I guess there's some level of bedroom farce that even stodgy old people like my parents are think is, is funny mm -hmm. what's what's with that that's an interesting thing to enter into so john martin feeney was born in 1894 to irish immigrant parents in maine and his brother francis ford who plays the old man the old man who's on his deathbed in one of in the most maybe the most cartoonish moment in the movie but your dad loved it. Yeah, but your dad loved it. He's the, <clears throat> the guy's literally, I guess he's not exactly doing last rites, but whatever he's nah, doing. No, he's just sort of like milking the sympathy and Yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah. And then the fight comes past. Old Francis Ford is going to jump out of his bed. So <laughs> in any case, that guy became kind of a marquee star in early Hollywood in the 10s, the 1910s. And he said, hey, John, why didn't you come join me? And then that guy's career went down while John quickly established himself and worked his way up to become a director of hundreds of silent films. He directed, well, I shouldn't say hundreds, but he directed 140 movies in his lifetime, 60 of which are lost because they wow. are it's crazy. old and silent, which is just a tragedy that film stock just wasn't good. And they didn't, nobody was thinking like John Ford, the great artist that's going to be discussed forever. They were thinking John Ford, he makes cowboy pictures. And so it's too bad. Hmm. 
But John Ford definitely cultivated an image as a tough guy. How much of an actual tough guy he was is one of those things that people will forever discuss. Maureen O'Hara herself indicated that she saw him having a gay affair. There's there's that kind of stuff that gets thrown around. I think it was Maureen O'Hara. I don't didn't actually re research that for this. There's there's the Spielberg story where he comes in covered in like ridiculous Looney Tunes smooch marks which is exactly again how spielberg Mm -hmm. describes it (laughs) and then there's the people who like john wayne who wanted to portray him as pappy john wayne called him pappy john wayne was at his deathbed when he died he was a father figure and he was a family man and his whole family joined him on every movie he had an extended family of actors that he worked with victor mclaughlin who plays the antagonist in this movie is Always showing up. Uh, Ward Bond, who plays Father Lonigan's, always showing up. Yeah, he's in all kinds. He's, of he's in all of them. Like all these, and, and all the kind of background people. I mean, it is one of those things. It's why people think that John Ford de- directed McClintock because it's his whole stock company <laughs> and all the extended family. John Ford just didn't. And John Ford actually did come in when the director got sick and direct a little bit of McClintock. But uh, the director of McClintock is actually Victor McLaughlin, who is. No, no, no. It's Andrew McLaughlin, who is Victor McLaughlin's son, Victor Victor McLaughlin being the the brother, the boxer in this movie. So John Ford, famous director. He directed How Green Was My Valley, The Searchers, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, My Darling Clementine, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, The Grapes of Wrath, The Quiet Man, Young Mr. Lincoln, just to name his most famous stuff. He directed film crew for the Navy for D-Day. He got shrapnel wounds in combat. He was at least a little bit of a real tough dude your spielbergs your movie brat generation they love him they learned a lot from him he is simple he prefers long shots and static sort of medium shots or long shots often composed against really vivid backgrounds and he only uses dramatic stuff for punctuation this movie is actually a fantastic example of that because you have a beautifully expressionistic flashback to the boxing Mm -hmm. stuff where john wayne's killed the guy and it's like, oh, John Wayne, John Ford's perfectly capable of being just as artsy as an Orson Welles or something like that. But he use he saves it and uses it for sparing. He's sparing sparingly. Yeah, he uses it for punctuation. <coughs> and so there's fun, there's moments of it. But not. fun fun fact, just in, yeah. in talking about that, my 11 year old son. So I flipped this movie on. I, I, I had to watch it later after the kids were in bed, but I got it started with the kids still up. And my 11 year old son connected the dots between Ford and Spielberg just watching the movie. Hmm. This movie reminds me of Spielberg, of a Spielberg movie. Did he have a specific idea in mind or just the just the general I think it was the framing and the in the cinematography really. Yeah. I think it was pretty early on, like the train pulling into the station and then I think yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly what it was, but but yeah, he just said this looks like a like Steven Spielberg movie. Shot, yeah. made this movie. Uh, well, I know what right. you mean. Just the sense of composition, the yeah. composition. If John Ford's not going to move the camera half as much as Spielberg, no. Spielberg's right. much more animated. Not even a quarter as much. Uh, mm. John Ford really just likes to... Which will bore you in the first third if you're not... Yeah, well, this movie does have a s- slow beginning. I, I think you can love it and love old movies and mm-hmm. still I, admit that. I was going to say that boxing scene, the flashback, I when I saw it, I thought, oh, this is where Martin Sc- Scorsese got everything he did in Raging, Raging Bull. Bull. Yeah, well, it's Raging true. Yeah. And, and Martin Scorsese said that. Good good catch. Uh, Martin Scorsese said, actually, Martin, what Martin Scorsese specifically said is, I shot Raging Bull in black and white because I didn't know how I was going to. He was so struck by the colors of the Quiet Man flashback and by how kind of weirdly diminished John Wayne actually looks in his uh-huh. yellow boxers. And he's like, oh, if I'm going to do the opposite, then I've got to capture the same expressionistic vibe, but mm-hmm. but do it in black and white. Huh. This is this movie and the searchers are the two that, uh, of course, the movie Bratz keyed off of. And what's his face? Uh, Spielberg would point to th- those two. Hmm. And Scorsese would point to those two. I mean, what Scorsese <laughs> said is every Western had these guys that I didn't know. But the searchers, Ethan Edwards, it's like, oh, that guy, that guy works with me. I see that guy all the time. I know that I knew I know who that guy is. He's one of us. He's, mm-hmm. he's just a Brooklyn guy. And he kind of, and he said, the quiet man, Victor McLaughlin <laughs> is a guy that I, like, I don't know who any of these people are. These are just weird Irish leprechauns, but Victor McLaughlin is a guy that I understand and beating the crap out of him is a thing, that, a thing <laughs> that I understand. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the relationship of course, between Wayne and O'Hara is something that I understand. 
So the quiet man. So so you can get a much more comprehensive context on John Ford in our stagecoach episode, which is just a just scroll up your podcast thing a little bit and you'll find it. The Quiet Man comes from a Saturday Evening Post story, 1933, written by Maurice Walsh. Ford bought the screen rights for $10. He had always wanted to tell a story about Ireland. Ford, as I said, is of Irish descent himself. But no movie mogul wanted to make this movie. It's not a commercial movie. Like, why why do you make this movie? It doesn't, Mm -hmm. like, how do you even... It, it seems inevitable in hindsight, especially knowing how well the last 10 minutes of this movie plays. But when you're yeah. pitching this movie, you're not pitching the last 10 minutes, really. You're pitching, like, the whole thing. And how do you pitch the whole thing? Like, it's a picaresque journey into Ireland. Oh, great. That's going to do yeah. boffo box office. So nobody wanted – none of the big studios wanted to do it. Republic, which was a B-movie studio, really wanted the chance to work with a prestigious director. And so they're like, oh, if we give Ford – the money to do this he'll come work for us but the deal that they made was that he had to do a western first and so ford did a western from republic rio grande which is a pretty good one and that's actually the first wayne o'hara team up and it features all the same people and then after they'd made their money it was just one of those classic one for us one for you deals so you do a western for us and then we'll give you the money to go to ireland and they were really having to pony up some cat like Ford's last movie before he did these this this two for cost two million. Republic's entire slate the, that year cost two million. So he really had to go slumming in order to get this movie made. But Rio Grande, while while it's a much lower budget than he used to work with, is pretty fantastic black and white western, and it's got that crackling chemistry between Wayne and O'Hara, which was soon to become famous. And and then he did he had the money to. Make the Quiet Man, and he had to really push to let them film in Ireland, which, of course, is what makes this movie. You just can't imagine it. Your son would not have said, "Oh, this reminds me of a Spielberg movie." If they'd shot it on a studio lot, because it would have felt like an old yeah. movie. Yeah. But instead, it feels very dynamic and in a place. And even this movie is actually more studio bound. More of it was shot in California than you might suspect. Mm. But uh, you can see pretty clearly some of the, like a lot of the fight stuff is yeah some of the a lot of the indoors stuff the fight stuff i think even the graveyard scene but the but you've got these wonderful scenes that aren't shot <laughs> in california and you sure can tell again i'll take us very quickly through duke wayne as they called him because uh, you can go back to stagecoach to listen to him his name was marion mitchell Mor- morrison he was a big beefy handsome ucal student who was going to be a football star but was benched because he broke his collarbone body surfing and became a prop boy at Fox. And Raul Walsh, another famous director with an eye patch who made manly movie pictures, saw him and sort of elevated him into a B-movie Western star. He became friends with Pappy Ford, who called him a big oaf and a dumb B-A-S-T-A-R-D and criticized his line delivery and his manner of walking and everything and, and helped make him... A star. There's a couple, there's a lot of guys that you'll read this basic story where they don't have any of what we associate with. And then a director or a mentor or someone says, You got to walk like this. You got to. Another famous example is Sean Connery, who was just a bruiser, just a, a not, he didn't have any of the charm or wit or sophistication of James Bond and the director of Dr. No. I forget what his name was, but he was a very worldly man and he took sean under his wing and he said here's how you wear a suit and actually did the jake trick he said put on this i want you to sleep in your suit yeah Uh, we're gonna get you tailored clothes from the best of the best and then you're gonna sleep in them because james bond has to feel like a guy who eats and breathes and sleeps in a three-piece suit and so he just made sean connery into a star and john ford same thing with john wayne a lot of people will speculate and sort of get real freudian that what what John Ford did was took everything that he wished he was and imbued it in John Wayne, took this young UCAL guy and said, I'm going to make you in the image of what I, the kind of man I wish I could be. And there might be something to that. I mean, John Ford was a weirdly performative guy. Like, yeah, okay. He had bad eyesight and he had to protect his eyes, but he didn't actually like no doctor made him wear an eye patch. He wasn't missing an eye. Like he, he definitely had a, a John Ford tough guy persona persona that he put on 
Uh, but anyway, in any case, John Ford and John Wayne worked well together and became iconic and did all kinds of movies together. And you can listen to the Stagecoach episode to get more about that. The person I really want to talk about today in a little bit more detail is Maureen O'Hara, a wonderful movie star, one of the greatest, I would say, of the classic era, although she has not that many classic, just iconic films to her name. But she does have a few. She's got Rio Grande, McClintock, The Wings of Eagles, The Quiet Man. Well, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm reading the wrong list. Those are the ones she did with John Wayne. And those are all great. Big Jake. I mean, those are they're varying quality, but they're all fun. But the ones that the movie, the classic movies she did were How Green Was My Valley, which famously stole the Oscar from Citizen Kane, Miracle on 34th Street, you might know her from. And of course, the original Disney Parent Trap with Haley Mills. She's mm -hmm. the mom in. So I guess none of those are like, a really the quiet man is how green was my beloved valley. in their own yeah in their own way but yeah i mean how green was my valley is great and well remembered but it's not it's no casablanca you know what mm -hmm. i mean like it's not the first tier of right classic movie dumb huh. but she is an amazing presence on screen they called her the queen of technicolor for obvious reasons it's like technicolor cameras were made for her she had this striking pale skin and red eye or red eyes <laughs> she had this striking red she eyes was she was a demon <laughs> she had red hair and green eyes and she just really popped and she's one of those women that aged incredibly gracefully you almost think she's more beautiful in her 30s like she is here than she was in her 20s when she was an ingenue it's like she was made to be a stern middle-aged woman more than she was to be a hot young thing so she had a long shelf life on her striking physicality and on top of that she was a good actress and i guess the other thing i'll say about her in terms of well we could talk about it but she really knew how to do this kind of thing with john wayne and with people and i think jake said it before on when we talked about katherine hepburn you compared the two of them and you said well marine o'hara or marino yeah marine o'hara I, I i keep wanting thinking I'm saying Catherine O'Hara, and I'm confusing the two. But I didn't in that case. Catherine O'Hara knows exactly when to fold. No, you did. Yep. Dang it. Maureen O'Hara. <laughs> Maureen O'Hara <clears throat> knows when to show the kitten under the tiger. She's, she's really good at that. If you read her autobiography, she's very conscious of that. That's something mm -hmm. that she cultivated and realized was a smart thing to do. And if you read her autobiography, she is, which you might have an opportunity to if you join our Patreon for $50 a month, uh, patreon.com forward slash sanity at the movies. She strikes me as a certain brand of, I don't even want to say feminist, but it's like a really old school version of feminism where it's like, I'm a woman, so my job is to stick up for women's rights, but I fully expect that the men are going to hold their own and stick up for their rights. And so it's like, I'm going to be really loud and annoying but then sort of expect that somebody's going to put me in my place and that's just the that's what I, that's the game we're playing mm -hmm. that's the game is, we're playing i play my own version of hard to get or hard to tame right but i want to be tamed right and that's i never forget as an actress as a character i just want to be tamed right and all i'm doing is testing to see if this man is worthy of me and can tame me. And she really does in this movie play that. She plays it extremely really, well. really well. And the iconic moment of that is the second that he gets the money, she runs to the furnace, opens it up. Right. She's proud of him. She's going to march. She's been drug and tired and whatever, but now she's going to march home with her head held her high. Her head held high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. Pretty great. You get she's like the kind of and and I feel like these women just don't really exist anymore. But they, but it's like your our grandma's generation. You might meet somebody like this. It's like she might say the most bold feminist things, but she'd be horrified if a man ever actually took her seriously. It's like, well, I'm a woman, so my job is to say all this stuff, and then your job is to say that's stupid, and this is just the fun of it. This is yeah. mm -hmm. the fun of it. So Maureen O'Hara, say a little bit about her life. She is such an Irish cliche. I mean, she was born to play the quiet man. She's born into this big, loving, joking, artsy Irish family with 4,000 siblings in Ranelagh, if that's how you say it, which is a suburb of Dublin. And she 
she's not above telling tall tales, but she remembers it all as warm and beautiful and joyous and just the best way to start life. And her parents were into opera and football. Her mother was an actress and a singer. And they're all kind of just the most sickening Irish cliche you could imagine living in their little village and stuff like that. And she always wanted to act. So as a teenager, she did some radio. She did some summer stock. And then at 14, she auditioned for the Abbey Theater, which is a really important theater in Dublin. And she was accepted. And Charles Lawton, who I think we've talked about, he was in, he's a great actor of film actor of the early 20th century. We watched the movie with him, Witness for the Prosecution. He's the main dude, the barrister guy. We might have actually done that over on the bookening. Yeah, that, we that didn't do have, it here. That might have been before. Yeah. So, but in any case, he's a great British Shakespearean, very serious. He played Quasimodo in the Hunchback, famous version of Hunchback of Notre Dame. And he offers her a screen test. She says, I'm a stage actor. I'm not going to. And then she's like, wait a second. I should become a Hollywood person and make lots of money and all that. And so she goes, she auditions. She's the hot young thing. Charles Lawton is very smitten with her. He offers her a personal contract. She stars in Jamaica Inn, a, an early Alfred Hitchcock British film hmm. with Lawton because Lawton demands it. Hitchcock doesn't want her, but Lawton's like, we are going to put this this young lady in here. Here, Apparently her, her screen test isn't that great, but Lawton could not forget her eyes. And so she goes to Hollywood basically under contract with Lawton and quickly rises up the ranks in Hollywood, becomes known as the queen of Technicolor, does How Green Was My Valley with John Ford, does a pirate movie that's fondly remembered called The Black Swan, does Miracle on 34th Street. And she, Maureen O'Hara is exactly what you would expect her to be. She is this brassy broad that sticks up for her rights and all that sort of thing. She actually has a little place in history as someone who made the U.S. government acknowledge Ireland as a state. So here's a little snippet. I, I got some snippets from her autobiography because I just I like the way she tells her stories. So she became an American citizen in 1946. She put up a huge stink about being referred to as a British citizen. And here's the, the story as she tells it, quote, the judge and I went into a very long discussion of all of Irish history. He challenged my assertions. We kept going over it and over it back and forth, but I wouldn't give an inch. I couldn't. Finally, he said, we're going to have to find out what Washington thinks. He instructed the clerk, check Washington and see what they consider a person like Miss O'Hara. The clerk left the courtroom and returned shortly after that. He told the judge, Washington says she is a British subject. I was furious and told the judge, I am not responsible for your antiquated records in Washington, D.C. He promptly ruled against me. I had no choice but to thank him and tell the court, under those circumstances, I cannot accept nor do I want to become an American citizen. I turned to walk out of the courtroom, but having the kind of personality that I do, Thought I couldn't give up without t taking one last crack at him. I was halfway out of the courtroom when I turned back to him and said, Your Honor, have you thought for one moment about what you're trying to force upon and take away from my child and my unborn children and my unborn grandchildren? He sat back and listened intently as I went on. You're trying to take away from them their right to boast and brag about their wonderful and famous Irish mother and grandmother. I just can't accept that. He'd had enough. The judge threw his hands up and exclaimed, Get this woman out of here. Give her anything on the papers that she wants. But get her out of here. The clerk moved in my direction, and I simply said, Thank you, Your Honor. Now, every chapter of uh, Maureen <laughs> O'Hara's autobiography is some story like wow. that. Disney. Not uh, self-aggrandizing. No, anyway. she's very no. self-aggrandizing, but in a lovable way, I think. She, She's very proud of her heritage and proud of what she did as a woman in Hollywood, all this kind of thing. She she got in a big fight with a certain Walter Disney when he said he was going to put her name on the top of, like, she was going to get first billing on Parent Trap. And then they decided to do a cutesy thing where they said, Parent Trap starring Haley Mills and Haley Mills, because the girl's playing both the twins. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to do that. And so they denied her her first billing. And she basically made such a stink that she never worked with Disney again, which is really too bad because she was the perfect kind of Disney mom. For, yeah, you know. totally. And you have to admit that the Haley Mills and Haley Mills thing is pretty smart, clever, and cute. Yeah. Just the, <clears throat> just give, give her some more money under the table or something. Yeah. Buy her off. <clears throat> buy her off. Make her feel good. Mm -hmm. But she wants her pride. You can't buy off Maureen O'Hara. Didn't you see the quiet man? Well, I guess you can't buy her off, but only in the way that she wants to be. By, only when she wants to be bought off. Well, only when she wants to be bought off and in the way that she wants to be bought <laughs> off. 
Let me read from her recounting of The Quiet Man. This will give you some insight into both her and John Ford and their working relationship. So she loved The Quiet Man. She believed in it. She believed in it so much she took stenography for Ford. Like as he came up with ideas, she'd just go over to his house and help write them down. Like this was a real passion project for her just because of the Irish connection. So here's a, here's a little anecdote from her autobiography. While one is working on a motion picture, it's natural to get mad at the others from time to time. I almost found myself in John Ford's barrel while we were shooting the Innisfree horse race sequence down on the beach. The scene again required the use of wind machines during one of my close-ups. But instead of the wind machine blowing my hair away from my face, Mr. Ford put the machine behind me and blew my hair forward. Well, at the time, I had hair like wire. It snapped and snapped against my face. The wind was blowing my hair forward, and the hair was lashing my eyeballs. It hurt, and I kept blinking. Mr. Ford started yelling at me and insulting me under his breath. Keach, keep your blankety-blank eyes open. Why can't you get it right? He kept yelling at me, and I was getting madder and madder. I finally blew my lid. I put two hands down the side of the cart and yelled, What would a bald-headed old son of a bleep like you know about hair lashing across your eye- eyeballs? The words had no sooner left my mouth than I was nearly knocked off my feet by the sound of a collective gasp on the set. No one spoke to John Ford that way. There was absolute silence. No one dared move, speak, or even breathe. I don't know why I did it. He made me mad, and I just blew my stack. Immediately, I thought, why didn't I keep my bloody mouth shut? He was going to throw me off the picture after years of waiting. And instead, he laughed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) After years of waiting to make the quiet man, I was about to be tossed off the set. I waited for the explosion. I waited without moving a muscle. Blah, 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 blah. The old man was deciding whether he was going to kill me or laugh and let me off the hook. I didn't know which way it would go until the very moment that he broke into laughter. Everyone on the set collapsed with relief and finally exhaled. They followed Mr. Ford's lead and laughed for 10 minutes out of sheer relief that I was safe. Then we went on and shot the scene. But in the end, the old man got the last laugh. He and Duke agreed to play a joke on me. To do it, they chose the sequence where Duke drags me across town and through the fields. I I bet you didn't know that sheep dung has the worst odor you have ever smelled in your life. Well, it does. Mr. Ford and Duke kicked all the sheep dung they could find onto the hill where I was to be dragged face down on my stomach. Of course, I saw them doing it. And so when they kicked the dung out of the field, Faye, Jimmy, and I kicked it right back off. They'd kick it in and we'd kick it out. Went on and on. Finally, until the scene was shot, they won. Getting in the last kick, there was no way to kick it out. The camera began to roll and Duke had the time of his life dragging me through it. It was bloody awful. After the scene was over, Mr. Ford had given instructions that I was not to be brought a bucket of water or a towel. He made me keep it on for the rest of the day. I was mad as hell, but I had to laugh too. Isn't showbiz glamorous? <laughs> wow. Is a uh, just like the structure of the movie and the style of the movie. There's such a structure and style to these types of stories. Yes. It's just so uh-huh. like they work. It's great. It's fun. It's good myth making. Yeah. Like, man, you can just like pick the beats out oh yeah oh yeah you know once you get started it's like anybody you can chat gpt is going to be able to tell to, to, yeah. 10 stories like this on a mm-hmm. tell me an irish and it, and if you imagine <laughs> it in her lilt it's yeah. even better so that's marine o'hara i'll have a couple more quotes from her on specific scenes as we go she does have a heck of a fun autobiography whether it's all true or not it doesn't really matter that much to me she's a she's a good teller of her own myth there are certainly people that have tried to portray her as more sexually debauched, as more this, as more that, as more calculating than she wants to per- portray herself. She did have a famous scandal where she was caught necking in a theater or something like that, but she always claimed that the paparazzi set her up, and they always claimed that they didn't. So very quickly, capping things off, we have Ward Bond, his father Lonigan. He was Bert the Cop. I think that's probably where most of our viewers yep. would, would know him. Mm -hmm. and was in a heck of a lot of John Ford pictures and stuff like that. I always played these no-nonsense kind of deep-voiced guys. Father Lonigan's probably one of his nicer guys. Uh, Victor McLaughlin, one of my favorite old-school character actors, plays the the brother, Danaher, whatever his... Danaher. Squire for (laughs) Fred Danaher, whatever his name is. He is a tough old bird. Uh, Joined the British Army at 14 with the intention of fighting in the Second Boer War but ended up stationed at Windsor Castle and then kicked out when his true age was discovered. Earned a living as a wrestler and a heavyweight boxer, if you can imagine that. And also served as a constable. Worked in the circus, where the gimmick was they would give $25 to anyone, or 25 pounds, I suppose, to anyone who could go three rounds with him, wrestling or boxing. And then served as captain in the First World War. So this dude just did it all, lived a lot of life, was exactly the dude that you'd want him to be. And then 
was in all kinds of movies. My favorite movie that he's in and one that will I'm sure do on this podcast someday is a the proto Indiana Jones movie Gunga Din with a Cary Grant jungle ad- India adventure kind of thing fight fighting the tuggies huh. but, but he's in a lot of john ford movies he won an oscar for john ford's the informer a john ford film that i've never seen quiet man is his other big claim to fame and then i suppose we should talk about barry fitzgerald who plays micheline finn he just always played these guys he was in how green was my valley bringing up baby i think he plays a doctor or something like that if you if you know going my way where bing crosby plays the world's most cute catholic priest Barry Fitzgerald plays the other cute Catholic priest, I think, the father of the parish. Or, or no, I'm not father of the parish. Whatever the higher-ranking priest. I forget what Catholic hierarchy is off the top of my head. But, not a uh, bishop? Maybe he is the bishop, but I don't remember. It's been a long time since I've seen that. He's the guy that's going to assign Bing Crosby to the parish or not, so I suppose that would be the bishop. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that's the cast. They went to Ireland, to County Galway. Ford knew the area. They got lots of local color. There's lots of actual people from the town. Maureen O'Hara's family, her brothers are in the movie. I think they're on the cart when she's when her hat doesn't get chosen, all that stuff. One funny anecdote is that the town got electricity for the movie. Like They had to bring in electricity, and so they hooked it up, and everybody was cheering. And so happy that they'd finally gotten electricity in 1951. And then they told them wow. they were going to have to pay for it. And they said, ah, <laughs> we don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> the weather was horrible. Rain, mist, fog. It's just one of those things where it made for a terrible shoot. But man, does it make the movie. It's just like all the all the temp- tempestuous weather really adds anytime it's raining in this mm-hmm. movie. Mm-hmm. It's just beautiful. They had to deal with the, all these Irish extras who were not used to being on a film set, didn't know you're not supposed to look into the camera, wouldn't remember their lines, stuff like that. And then they finished the movie. Republics demanded that it be under two hours. And so old John Ford, he played a trick on them. He arranged the screening with all the people and brought the producers in. And the film was playing like gangbusters and we were and he was dragging Marine O'Hara across the field and all that and we got all the way up to the fight and then the two minute or the two hour mark hit and the movie shut <laughs> off and the crowd went crazy and the producer was like, Ah, finish it, finish it And so Ford played the last nine minutes of the movie and they said, Okay, you can do two hours and nine minutes or whatever. Which I think maybe the producer should have said, cut nine minutes out of the other stuff because <laughs> it is a little bit longer. It would have made a better movie. But it was one of the biggest successes in Republic Pictures history and mostly got by the censors. Although in the, the state of Ohio, our neighbor, they made them cut our favorite line. Impetuous Homeric got cut in Ohio. It was just what? too filthy. Because <sighs> what Micheline Flynn thinks is that they've had sex on the bed and caused it to break. Is that what... Is that what that line's about? And, and very, a very Homeric night of lovemaking in Ohio was just too scandalized by that. <laughs> Here in Indiana, we were okay with it. <laughs> 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 so, but yeah, apparently one out of the 49 states that I think would have been, oh, it was Hawaii in the Union by 1950, whatever. I don't I doubt it. I, d- I kind of doubt it, but I do not remember. So, we were just watching a movie at home the other day that talked about 48 states or something like that certainly 1959 yeah yeah that's what i thought because you certainly watch old movies and they mention the 49 or 48 states so that is the history of the quiet man it has gone on to be a very successful and beloved film it has recently been restored so the version you can watch is pretty good now but it is one of those old technicolor movies which are hard Three strip Technicolor is just what it sounds like. It's three different strips, a blue and a red and a yellow, and you have to preserve all three of those strips. And so something like Gone with the Wind, of course, gets lots of preservation money thrown at it. But an old Republic movie that isn't quite Gone with the Wind maybe doesn't get as much. So, But fortunately, the version that you can find on Amazon Prime is good and there are good people this is the kind of movie that they will preserve it's just not going to quite get the money thrown at it that gone with the wind or something that stands to make the studio studios still some money is is going to get but they're not they're not going to let this movie be destroyed in any case so i think we can all of that to say we can watch this movie in a version that pretty pretty well replicates the experience but maybe isn't as pristine as 
like a Casablanca or a Gone with the Wind would be. But yeah, okay, so big picture thoughts. Ben, you'd never seen this before. What'd you think about old The Quiet Man? I liked it. It was fun just to be in a different country. In that sense, it did feel like an anomaly. And I, I don't know. I, it's just a movie about soaking in a culture, mm-hmm. like living in fairy world, even more than it's about anything else. I don't know. It's like, I just want a movie in Ireland. I just want a version of Ireland that's like beautiful and idyllic. And I, we're just going to go hang out there. It is very much a hangout movie. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I enjoyed that. <clears throat> I think I was expecting even more plot, maybe. <clears throat> You Sorry. expected wrong. Yeah, I expected wrong, but I wasn't bored. I liked hanging out with everyone. I liked being in Ireland. It's very nostalgic, but it got away with it in my book. The romance was fun. Right. I don't think I'd... S- well, I have seen Marina Hara and other things, but I didn't remember her. Parent Trap. Sure. Miracle on 34th Street. I just had forgotten that was her. Well, she really crackles in her pairings with Wayne. I mean, they have yeah. fantastic chemistry. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. that's really where people remember her from. But she is good in those other movies. I, I'm sure she is. Yeah, but she was great in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was just fun. It does feel long, mm-hmm. though. I didn't mind just hanging out. It's one of those movies that almost plays better, like on Saturday morning on AMC, and it's just like you're in and out, and yeah, and then of, you can tune in for the final right, yeah, yeah and then everybody gathers the final Donny Brook for the Donny Brook, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. It had some of the same fun as other like Philadelphia Story, or it happened one night mm-hmm. with the chemistry, the sexual charge between Wayne and O'Hara, mm. and, and then the I'm afraid that's going to make noise, and then the big feminist ending. The big feminist ending. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why? Because she gets what she wants. Well, yeah, you can't give the woman what you want. Oh. We'll, talk, we'll talk about it. Jake, what did you think this time around? You'd seen it before, obviously. You said it, it fell <laughs> yeah, out of first it, tier. Yeah, it didn't hold up to the standard that I had raised it to or that it had held in my mind. And I, I think some of that's just like the sheen and fun of living in Ireland for that long just wasn't there for me and maybe hasn't quite been there for me for a while so i think that's part of it i mean it's good yeah it's a great movie it's fun it's got all kinds of great things about it just sort of yeah i don't i don't know what what else to say about it exactly maybe until we get more into the discussion it's, yeah. just, it's just a little slow it takes a while to build it's been so much time just sort of like it enjoys living and sort of scene dressing much more than i enjoy mm-hmm mm that sort of thing in general and in in this movie in particular. So, mm. But it's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't feel like I want to go back and watch it again right now. I feel like give it quite a while. Because it's you see why they did what they slow. did with McClintock. Stamp up the cartoony and the... Just, yeah. Oh, you know, people would have loved this movie much more if they could have just had f- had more fun in each act. I mean, McClintock's going to make all the characters into cartoon characters, add a lot of slapstick. It's going to have the Donnie Brook type stuff be in the first third, like the big mud yeah, fight. It's going to making... amp it all up and not be as good of a movie, but... Yeah, but which one would I rather go back to? Probably What's going to be more fun? McClintock's enjoyable. more fun to just turn on. But, the, you know, McClintock's not half the movie that this is. Yeah, um, yeah, for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. So I find this movie complicated to talk about i really enjoy it obviously i mean i think it's a great movie i recommend that anybody watch it if they haven't seen it and it's a movie that i'll go back to and me and my wife enjoy watching it we've watched it before i suppose we in order to talk about it we just have to talk about it i love what i would say is the second act of this movie is a perfect movie to me the actual courtship and the early marriage and the what's a nice way of saying what happens the they can't come together stuff that's all a really that's all the materials of a truly great movie and then the early setup stuff is just kind of the early setup stuff and then i actually found as as fun as the ending is i wasn't sure how i felt about it narratively this time around for reasons that i guess we'll talk about but i guess the broadly speaking it's just like man you actually have a really interesting story here you have a really interesting and powerful story and then the ending is just kind of a shrug like <laughs> yeah we're, we're, and that's what people love about it and it's intentionally that way 
Right. It's like, well, actually, they just needed to punch each other, and the little lady needed dragged across the field. So they, actually, this wasn't a big deal. He needed deal. to jump through all the hoops. And yeah. He just needed in to, order to in order to satisfy the yeah, but well, let me make that a, a ritual. Yeah, it, yeah, it was he, a ritual. He was refusing to go through it. Everybody knew the ritual was a joke, but everybody also felt obligated to hold him to the ritual, and so he went through. The, he decided, fine, I'll jump through this stupid ritual hoops. I'll make you all happy, and then we'll live happily ever after. Right. And pick and choose what we want from the ritual after that, which right. I find a little bit prob- problematic. Like the movie wants to have her grab the stick and throw it away. And I'm like, eh, you know, lady, you made him jump through all these hoops. And now now that's a hoop you don't like. I don't know. I don't know, lady. Not that I'm saying he needs to beat her. That's not what I'm saying for any idiots that are listening. But uh, the, the movie just wants to have its cake and eat it, too. I think the middle part of the movie doesn't feel like it. Now, the proper ending to... Nathan's movie is she gets on the train and she leaves and <laughs> he's sad because they couldn't make it work. And nobody, I'm not arguing that that was the ending I want. And in other words, the ending that actually takes all the narrative stuff <coughs> seriously is maybe just makes a movie that no one cares or remembers. Like everybody loves the ending of this movie. So I can't really argue against it. I just, it's like the very thing that makes this movie memorable and likable is also the thing that maybe for me takes it out of the first tier of that breaks it that breaks it it's always problematic for me these movies where the audience's rooting interest is different than the character's rooting interests where we really want the guy to break his vow and he really doesn't any kind of movie where the hero is a pacifist or something like that i'm always like no but as an audience member i like violence like i want to see like the whole i i and the whole town does i bought my ticket to watch john wayne be john wayne and the whole Conceit is that John Wayne doesn't want to be John Wayne. That's an interesting tension, and this movie plays with it interestingly, but there's no really good way to resolve that tension. I, let me take us through the movie. I, I, we, talk a little, we talk more about that when we get to it, I guess. So, The Quiet Man. You got the train arriving. You got the cutesy Irish locals. There you go. Oh, you want to go to Innisfree? Well, you see that road over there? <laughs> Don't take that road. That's... Do you guys feel, I mean, one of the, one of the things that are, what's the word? Some of the dialogue regarding this movie is the same as for Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. Basically, is it paternalistic in the way that it views these people or does it view them with actual real affection and respect? How would you feel if somebody was putting this lens on your culture? And what do you guys think? It kind of is my culture. Right. So, and um, I think that's part of what I responded to and enjoyed about it. I'm three quarters British Isles, right. just a mutt of that and some German thrown in. And so it's just like, well, okay. I, it, you have to, if you're going to do things like that, you have to play and dabble in stereotypes and that's part of the fun of it. And right. You don't feel belittled by no, I feel all these like little it's provincial a, I think No, I think it's affectionate and sweet. And I feel like I'm pretty sensitive to that, to that sort of thing. Right. I hate passionately faux Southern Hollywood Southern <laughs> stuff. Like, I just cannot abide it. Mm-hmm. I can't abide it when we write it. Yep. I, I found that out one, one time. I remember that. Just drives me nuts because it's smug and condescending. It and drives you nuttier than a griddle cake on a, a possum's yep, it's <laughs> tractor. Smug, it's smug and condescending, and <laughs> I just I can't stand it. But I don't feel that way about about this. Maybe I should. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that you could point to what this is doing differently. Like it is, it is like, oh, here's a bunch of cutesy leprechaun type, especially with Michaeline Flynn. It's just like he's a leprechaun. Yeah, I mean, that but, is his but, character. But, but uh, that feels like the kind of folktale they would tell about themselves. Okay. Yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, it's, yeah it's this not, is how they want. It to just be. feels like yeah, this is our stereotypes of us, and this <clears> is the kind of thing that we might recognize in our own culture. No, and then they pick at it here and there too. So it's like, well. It would be an American who would think to to do Emerald Green here, Red holds up better or whatever. When he paints the outside of his cottage, he turns it into his own idealized understanding of, yeah. of right. Ireland. And they're all sort of like, well, it's pretty. It's not how we would do it. Right. And so... It, it, yeah. What I actually feel like is the memories and images of various BBC shows I've seen a single episode of are coming to my mind. And I'm like, this is how in the British Isles you 
portray your own stereotypes for the purpose of entertainment. Right. And everyone recognizes what you're doing when you go into the countryside and you have the guy, that guy at the bar. It's just like, it doesn't seem like it's looking down on them in particular. Yes, I would agree with that. I mean, I hate twee British television programs. Like, I like this. This doesn't bother me. But any modern kind of, you know, my wife was watching called the mid, she watches called the midwife sometimes. And she watches, oh, he, people always want us to read his books on the booking. James He's, Harriet? James Harriet stuff. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a fan. I've um, seen a couple episodes. And it's just always like, oh, here in the twee British or Irish countryside, we're all so eccentric and we have our little quirks and we gather at the pub and he's quirky and I'm quirky and I'm mad about something stupid. And it drives me crazy. I'd much rather watch Southern people, Southern Gothic kind of, well, we're all just uh, like a bunch of flies on a griddle kind of stuff <laughs> than as cartoony as that is, for whatever reason, that doesn't bother me. Maybe because I'm not from the South, so I'm just like, <laughs> in your face, South. <laughs> we gotcha. <laughs> you You're all just a bunch of flies on a griddle. <laughs> but I hate twee. I hate the word twee, and I hate anything that goes for tweeness. Like, oh, oh, we're twee British people. You know, like, there's a whole bunch of independent movies in the 90s, Waking Ned Divine, The Full Monty, stuff like that, where it's just like, oh, we're these eccentric working class Guys are, I'm from, I can't do a Liverpool accent, but they'd be from Liverpool or Ireland and they'd all have their little quirks and they'd all sing their little songs. And I don't have a lot of sympathy. Maybe I'm a horrible racist is what I'm realizing. I don't Mm. have a lot of sympathy for, for that stuff and for that culture like i didn't like those animated movies that you guys made me watch on this very podcast the uh, song of the sea song of the sea it just drives me nuts that all that like oh we're so twee and we have our little stories kind of stuff i'm realizing i'm a horrible racist oh no (laughs) this may be the answer (laughs) the rosetta stone the rosetta stone (laughs) 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 and it turned out he was a racist all along (laughs) But I, so I don't know why this one doesn't bother me. I, I guess just because it feels of a piece with all the stuff that John Ford always does. Like the search, even the searcher is as serious as it is. It's going to have its little, oh, he wants to marry him and he wants to marry him and they're going to have a fist fight and he's going to fall into some water. And all it is is there's a good way of doing it and a bad way of doing it. Yeah. Isn't it? I don't when know when it feels sure. self satisfied, I guess I don't like those things when they feel self really smugly self satisfied with themselves. I think that's a good identification point of this kind of thing you don't like. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like you know, it, you know it when you see it. It's like pornography. Yes. Some senator famously said he knows pornography. How do you define pornography, sir? I don't know, but I know it when I see it. It's like a famous quote from the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> good pull. <poll. laughs> Thanks. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't resent all that stuff equally, but it's not my pick. The, right. the twee stuff you're talking about. But I didn't feel like this was that either. Yeah, well, maybe it's because you have John Wayne as an outsider and he's being hurt by all the twee little, all their little rituals and stuff. Like the, it's actually, to use a pretentious word, it's interrogating the all this stuff. And so that makes for an interesting story. Like e- even if the culture class is, clash is rather easily dispensed with at the end, at least we're not pretending like that tension doesn't exist. And so it's, yeah, it's fun to watch John Wayne navigate it. It's fun. Even just things like he walks into the bar and there's the two brother guys that aren't into him. And, and nobody's then, into him until he can identify himself as being in. Right. He's he's Mr. Thornton's son. Yeah. Until he's Mr. Thornton's son and Mr. Thornton's grandson. Right. Until he's Michael Thornton's son and Sean mm. Thornton's grandson. He's nobody and nobody's going right. to, everything's going to grind to a halt. Yeah. Ah, it works well. Where are we? So he gets out of the train. He meets Micheline Flynn, everybody's favorite character from this movie, a little goofball Irish stereotype dude. I do think in a movie, in a culture clash movie, you need one person. I think it's fair, in fact, to have one person who just represents every... It's like if Kevin Costner is going to join the Native Americans, then there has there's like, sure, there's the father Native American and there's the princess babe Native American. But then like, there's the medicine man who's just like, he's totally an Indian everything. He's the, and McLean Flynn is that. He's just like, he's everything. He's the matchmaker. He's the... He's the one who understands all the rules and is going to be sure that the proprieties 
are, are observed. Right. No patty fingers, if you please. He does not like his, his anti patty fingers. That's what I noticed about Marcus of Queensberry rules. Marcus of Queensberry rules, if you please. <laughs> and then you have some of John Ford's amazingly straightforward storytelling where John Wayne's like walking up on his house and you just hear this corny flashback of his mom like, don't you remember, Shawnee, how it was? The road led up to the chapel and wound around it. And uh, this is who I am and why you're There's here. all kinds of little things like that that he gets away with. Like you forget for most of the movie that this movie actually has a narrator. Right. But right. it does. Yeah, he it's just a pops narrated in. movie. Yeah. <clears throat> who po- and the narrator pops in and out whenever he needs to. It just sort of like gets lost. To, in the... Well, but doesn't, at the end, doesn't the narration, wait a minute. Where does the narrator stop? Does the movie catch up to his narrating? Did that actually happen at a point? No, because after the fight, he says, and so peace was restored oh, yeah, to yeah, 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 whatever yeah, the right. town yeah. is called. You're right. Yeah, it's like Father yeah. Lonergan, who has no particular perspective on anything besides being the guy that instigated the conspiracy, I guess. But he's just like, like you don't really know why it's his perspective that we need to see all this from. Like he doesn't, I guess he tells off Maureen O'Hara for not sleeping with her husband at one point, but he doesn't, he doesn't. Usually when somebody's the narrator, you're like, oh, of course that guy would be the narrator because he was in a position to see things or influence things in a special way. And I guess you could say that about Father Lonergan, but he kind of feels like just another, I guess he's Ward Bond, so he has a certain authority that most people don't in the town don't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you just give him some things like pretend like he's way older than he is and, oh, right. I knew your grandfather and I knew your dad and I was, you know, I baptized you and yeah. whatever. I mean, he's a good character. Just uh, assert, he becomes a sort of like magical Irishman too right. at that point. Yeah, right? he does. He's the magical Catholic priest who's just sort of always been around and, yeah. you know. I love the running joke, by the way, of your grandfather, he died in a penal colony. And your father, he was a good man too. He was a good too. man yeah. too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> died in Australia. <laughs> that was pretty cool. I was trying to think if I, I have ever actually met this stereotype, like the Catholic priest who is just the patron saint of his community and sort of dispenses sage wisdom and shows up at everyone's birthday party and is just always, I suppose they must exist. And, and maybe I have met one or two of them. My extended family was Catholic. I remember the guy that remarried my, or didn't remarry, but he did like their 40 year re our vow thing for my grandmother and grandfather. He was a little bit like that and kind of the cigarette smoking. I've met that guy here. Yeah. I think that guy very much exists. Yeah, I think he does too. I wasn't trying to argue he didn't. I was just thinking yeah. how much I've encountered it. You see him all the time hmm. in movies like that. Yeah. yeah. Either a Catholic priest is a monster or a bumbling idiot or this. The just sort the of like uncle. Magical kind of. fairy uncle who's present and part of everything. Yeah. And always has been. Comes and in kind of always some will be. Comfort if you're, if you're. Always big. has the right thing to say or somebody you can lean on. And Yeah. He's gonna you, th- 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 when you need some third act advice to so you can go and run and catch your girl at the airport or whatever. He's gonna yeah. show up to have that thing. Yeah, I suppose I suppose they they do exist. Well, okay, now we're we're in our carriage with Micheline Flynn, and we're going to encounter the most beautiful woman in the world, Mary Kate Donaher, red haired, blue bloused, scarlet skinned, scarlet scarlet skirted. I wrote she's barefoot it's the beautiful irish countryside and she's just going to we get an iconic shot that illustrates exactly the advice that john ford gave sammy fableman gonna yeah it would be interesting to just watch this movie through the lens of horizon lines i kind of did but he definitely like when he wants to be striking and that's that's the i think the prime example Mm. of it she at a certain point, it's just like her head on the screen with a little bit of trees and sky. Yeah. You know, she sort of walks away, but it's a big upshot. It's an amazing sequence. It's one of those things. It has nothing to do with John Wayne's perspective, only his emotional perspective. Yeah, she's mm-hmm. towering over the audience in a way. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's crazy. Imagine being Maureen O'Hara and having to... Like you need to play the vision of everything that's lovely and you need to establish all of this. And the movie doesn't work 
if you're not the personification of everything that's great about Ireland and everything that's great about womankind all in a couple of shots. The movie falls on its face and unless you're the most beautiful woman in the world, the shepherdess, the Colleen, that yeah, like mm-hmm. it's an impossible thing to be asked to play. And she does it. And a lot of that's just gifts that God gave her, but some of it is she she knows how to play a scene like that. Like she, I don't know. I don't I don't know how she does it. It's her bearing. It's she's chewing her lip a little bit. I mean, I don't know. That's stuff she does with her eyes. Yeah, she, she widens she, them she, for she effect. Does a lot, yeah. She's in that scene noticing him. Yeah. Or noticing him noticing her and yes. just responding. She's just as taken with John Wayne as we're supposed to be taken with her. That's supposed to play into how we see her in that moment. Whether there's anything about that that's true to life or not. Yeah, no, it's it's pure fairy tale. Like I've stumbled across the princess in the tower or whatever. Well, I, <clears throat> what it instantly reminded me of, and is, she instantly fell in love with me. Right. What it ins- what it re- reminded me of right away is the Sicily and the Godfather. Yeah, I thought of the same thing. It it has that same sort of. It's the same fairy tale. Fairy thing. tale. Yeah, it's the same fairy tale thing. And it has the same kind of. You have to go to a, the old country to meet this kind of woman and have this kind of because this does that kind of thing doesn't exist here but maybe it did somewhere in your storied past right you're you're like stepping into the past somehow it's the kind yeah. of thing that the love story of your parents or your grandparents yeah and so you have to go back to the old country to get it thought all about the godfather sicily sequence a lot it is a touchstone for that kind of stuff the yeah yeah i went to the old country and stumbled across the most beautiful woman in the world my assumption is that if that is that if you is is if an unattached man sees an unattached woman and they start to have that kind of connection like like that it's probably a bad idea <laughs> not to be cynical john wayne says hey is that real or hey is that real she couldn't be yeah oh yeah. nonsense man it's only a mirage brought on by your terrible thirst <laughs> i'm sorry folks i did not mean to do a bad irish accent for half of this podcast it's just happening that's why we don't review the quiet man i guess but yeah so they fall in love. I do, I do think, Jake, what you said about she's doing a lot. She's, she's falling in love. She's using her eyes. I saw, a, I saw an interview with an editor once, and he was giving advice to young actors, and he was saying, here's why I don't choose your footage. And then he showed some footage, and it was a man and woman talking, and he showed the reaction shot of the actress who was talking to the man, and she was just looking at him. And he was like, now compare that to this. And he showed another reaction shot, and she was like looking him over with her eyes. She was smiling a little bit. She was doing stuff. And he was like, she just gave me something to cut to. This woman has a shot at a career in the industry because as a lowly editor, I'm going to think I should cut to her. I should give her more screen time. Whereas this other woman isn't just isn't doing anything. And so they're both in a commercial for whatever. And one of them might be a star and one of them never will be. Yeah. Sidney Lumet in his book, Making Movies, talks about this sort of thing, which we gave away to, to patrons. Yes. This past month or month before, I forget, depending on how this Yeah, was uh, last month, I guess, yeah. He talks about the vulnerability that you have to have in the walls that people put up and their willingness to overcome them. In a scene, it makes or breaks those types of scenes. The actresses or the actors who are willing to, to reveal something personal about themselves and break down some walls. So he tells a story of, of an actor who he just wasn't, for personal reasons, that Lumet refuses to speculate on, just would not look the actress in the eyes. He'd look at her forehead. He'd look everywhere else. And finally, instead of addressing the root issue, he just said, look, you have to, I want you to lock onto her eyes and never let her eyes go in this next scene. And then sparks flew, and probably they committed adultery, and that's what he was trying to avoid. Mm-hmm. But, but that's the kind of thing that makes these scenes work. Right. Well, and by the way, I should say uh, a lot of people have speculated about Wayne and O'Hara for that very reason. And uh, O'Hara says no. Lots of people from the time and after have said yes. She says no. Wayne said no. I mean, Wayne was a serial adulterer. I don't think Wayne would have been above it if he was interested. But the way they always wanted to portray their relationship, true or false, was as really good friends. And John Wayne said she's the best guy I ever worked with. So the way that they both wanted to portray it was she was just one of the fellas because she could give as good as she got. Yeah, she wasn't like all these other women that John Wayne worked with who were too hoity-toity for John Wayne. But 
I don't know what the reality of that is. I'm just printing the legend here. So they go to mass. John Wayne pulls a little trick there, makes her dip the water, dips, dips her fingers or whatever. Quite the forward gesture on him. What's his face says, who taught you to be playing patty fingers in the holy water? He plays patty fingers in the holy water. And then we meet Will, Will, Squire Will Donaher, Victor McLaughlin, who feels like he's stepped out of a silent movie or something like that. I mean, he is just the bad guy. I don't know, did you guys think that his performance was effective in doing everything that it needed to do? Or how did you guys feel about Victor McLaughlin in this movie? Yeah, it's great. I'm always surprised by how little there is to his character. I mean, he really... Yeah, there's almost nothing. He's not Biff from Back to the Future. Like as a, as a personality, he brings some warmth and some an endearing stupidity to the character, I guess. <laughs> but like, you have to be happy that they're best friends. That they come home arm arm in arm at the end, and somehow they pull that off. I'm not even sure exactly how. Besides that, Victor McLaughlin's just a. Because that's what kid. happens after a fight. Yeah, yeah. Does it matter? Just doesn't matter. That's what happens after a fight. You prove yourself to each other. You respect each other, and. If you're both man enough about it, then you come away. More often than not, that's just how it works. And you say, woman of the house, some, make me some dinner. Just like I always say when I get, <coughs> get home from work. I like the, just skipping ahead, you can stop me if there's anything you guys want to talk about here, but I think we can probably go through this one pretty quickly. They have the most uh, little boy passive aggressive, and that's, I guess it's aggressive aggressive, but the handshake thing where they're trying to mm -hmm. squeeze each other's hands. Yeah, that's fine. Um, the, John Ford loves those kinds of, uh, what's the way to say it on a family podcast? Peeing contests Be, between men. It's, uh, in all his movies, there's always going to be something like that. And it's always really, that's the place where I actually feel a little condescended to as a man. I'm like, eh, we're not actually all sixth graders. And being a sixth grader is not the ideal of of manhood. I, I guess you could argue it's symbolic or something like that I, or i didn't feel kind of sent to i just felt like donaher is going to be this way right john wayne has john wayne's in he's got to match it he's got to he just has to play with it yeah go with it. <coughs> i suppose i mean i guess i've seen too many other john wayne movies where john wayne whatever sean thornton is i know john wayne <laughs> likes to prove himself in those nathan it's okay if we don't agree why don't we shake on it <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right. Yeah, we'll let's shake. shake. Oh, oh, I'm not manly I enough. I see your perspective. <laughs> Hope you see mine. Now we're best friends. Now we're best friends. <laughs> <laughs> Make some dinner, woman. <coughs> all right, Sean. They, so there's all the bar stuff, and then Sean goes home. The weather is wild. They got this fantastic weather that they just happened to capture. And then we have this romantic scene where she's swept up his house and. He catches her and he grabs her and he kind of looms over her and uh, kisses her and she says, it's a bold one you are. And But then she kisses him too. She, she liked it. And yeah, there's that scene. What do you guys think about that scene? <laughs> they don't make scenes like that anymore. <laughs> no, they don't. No. <laughs> Probably the last time we had a scene like that was between Han Solo and Princess Leia in Empire Strikes Back. And it's not anything like as potent as this, but it's it's one of the last, chronologically, the last times I can remember the sort of whole, like, there's two characters and there's this electrical current between them. And he takes a step forward and she takes a step back and then she goes forward and he takes a step back. And there's like this charge between them and it's almost like a harry potter wizard duel or something like that like where they're both like back and forth and there's all this energy and it's like a romance novel almost and it's will they or won't they and there's i don't know what to say about it besides they're both doing a lot and she's doing a lot with her eyes and with her i mean with body language and I guess that's a really obvious thing to say, but it's just like if somebody's writing a, or or blocking a romance scene now, I don't know that they think about the simple things you can do with your body to indicate desire or to indicate lack of desire or to indicate reticence or like you can do things. You can block things. You can have people stand in such a way and do things with their eyes that mean things. And some of that's just the innate chemistry between these actors, but a lot of that is just 
people understanding what makes a romantic scene and doing it, which I suppose we'll talk about even more when we get to the real romantic scene in this movie, which is coming up soon. But first, we have to get through Micheline, the matchmaker. This is where the movie drags a little bit for me. He's drunk. <laughs> he likes to drink, old Micheline. Imagine that, an Irish guy that likes to drink. So we get two scenes where he tries to talk to Mary-Kate. Yes. I do like the scene where, I think it's sweet when McLean says that Sean has complete indifference to the fortune, and then she jumps up and she's really happy, and she faces the camera with a big smile on her face, and, and then she gets it together and realizes that's actually not... That's a bad thing. That's, the, that's not the ritual that she's supposed to enact, and so she goes back and... <laughs> says gives her more proper reaction so sean aka john wayne thinks that he can just play a sound from his computer in the middle of a podcast that's what i think <sighs> since when has been john wayne i don't know since he squeezed my hand in an earlier segment <laughs> in this podcast i just and left it hurting it. forever partner <laughs> pilgrim? pilgrim is what you're looking for there <laughs> Well, Ben, somebody ought to belt you in the mouth, but I won't. I won't. The <laughs> hell I won't. No, I got you. That is a great moment from McClintock. He thinks he, she's, it's what he just needs to get her consent. But this is Ireland, Sean. Without a brother's consent, she couldn't and wouldn't. I'm sorry for the both of you. And then he's going to get his stuntman to ride a horse and do crazy suicidal jumps. And then we're going to have this long race and all that stuff. And I don't know, I guess the movie's not dragging too much here, but we are going to have a lot of race and they're going to grab the hats and no one's going to grab Maureen O'Hara's hat. It's so sad. But they're all going to play a stupid sitcom joke on the brother and he's going to decide they can get married. Yay. Or no, they can court. Yay. And mm -hmm. then they're, they're going to start courting under the auspices of Micheline Flynn. No patty fingers, if you please. And they're going to go for a walk, and then they're going to steal a bicycle and get away and have, for my money, the most romantic scene in movie history. Maybe. The graveyard scene? The graveyards. Well, yeah, and everything leading up to it. Ah, most romantic scene in movie history. That's probably not I don't true. know about that. Yeah. yeah. The scene for, for that kind of thing. So there's dialogue scenes that are more romantic. There are kissing scenes, I suppose, <clears throat> that are more romantic. But in terms of a sequence... There are a lot of homages to that whole right. sequence in that scene in particular in the graveyard. The, yeah. Well, I, I include the whole, the montage of them walking, him throwing the hat. The, mm -hmm. he, I mean, there's nobody that can watch that. Well, let me speak for myself. I couldn't watch that without thinking of specific moments from our, me and Meredith's dating from the first time that I held her hand. I mean, for me, actually, I think more about the first time I held her hand than the first time we kissed because there was just something. Call me a sixth grader, if you will. But there was something really electric about, oh, my hand's coming towards yours. Who's going to take whose hand first? Mm -hmm. And then we're holding hands, and it's just like, I'm holding her hand. Ah. And there is this there is this electrical current going yep. through both of you. And I don't know. You suddenly understand that the Beatles weren't being horribly square when they said, I want to hold your hand. They were being provocative. <laughs> and mm -hmm. sexual and so that sort of just oh we got we went on a date we went for a walk we held hands like that this sequence captures that kind of thing as well as anything and then obviously most people have had some version of we got caught in the rain or we were alone on the park bench or whatever mm -hmm. it is and in terms of cap capturing those feelings this scene in a, in a big broad expressionistic kind of a way does it about as well as I defy you name a movie scene that does it better. I'm not hearing anything. I'd have to think I win. about it a bunch. You win. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair, but it's it, good. Yeah. And then the graveyard stuff obviously is justifiably famous. John Wayne's going to shirt's going to get wet and she's going to be scared of the thunder and here, I'll read you from, I'll read you Maureen O'Hara's take on it. You'll see how conscious she is of exactly the effect they were going for and how they got it. This is from her autobiography again, called Tis Herself, because of course it is. She says, of course, the scene that everyone always asks me about is the scene with Duke and me in the cemetery. Most of the quiet maniacs, those who keep the film in its cult-like status, 
tell me this is their favorite scene. It is sensual, passionate, and more than any other scene we ever did together displays the on-screen eroticism of the Wayne and O'Hara combination. There were two parts to that scene. The first part, we had to get in one take, or Mr. Ford would have strung us up by our toes. It's everything that happens right up to the embrace and kiss. We had to get it in one take because our clothes were sopping wet when we finished. If we missed it, then our costumes would have to be cleaned, dried, and ironed. Our hair would have to be washed, dried, and reset. Makeup would have to be reapplied. These things take hours and hours and cost thousands of thousands of dollars for each take. We got it in one. Once we were drenched and part one was in the can, we could focus on the kiss. But Mr. Ford rarely allowed more than a couple of takes, and I think that we got it in two. Why is that scene so romantic? Why were Duke and I so electric in our love scenes together? I was the only leading lady big enough and tough enough for John Wayne. Duke's presence was so strong that when audience saw him finally meet a woman of equal hell and fire, it was exciting and thrilling. Other actresses looked as though they would cower and break if Duke raised a hand or even hollered. Not me. I always gave as good as I got, and it was believable. So during those moments of tenderness, when the lovemaking was about to begin, audiences saw for half a second that he had finally tamed me, but only for that half second. I think she sums it up nicely. I think she knows exactly what she's doing. Yep. So yeah, we go to the wedding. Red Donahue makes cringy, fool of himself, punches out John Wayne. We get that expressionistic flashback sequence, which is awesome. And then we go into the best part of the movie, I think, where she'll wear your ring, she'll cook, she'll wash, she'll keep the land, but that's all until she's got the dowry. She's no married woman. She's the servant. She's always been. (laughs) And she goes and she locks the door and another famous, justifiably famous moment, John Mm -hmm. Wayne smashes the door open and says, there'll be no locks or keys between us mary kate except for the ones in your mercenary <laughs> that was my favorite line <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness and he kisses her and uh, she thinks maybe he's going to do more than that and he probably thinks about it too but then he throws her on the bed and is she disappointed yes she is but also he doesn't want to dominate her that's not his whole deal man but also, yeah, and then she's sobbing, and everybody comes over next day, and the bed's broke. And it's funny, because they all make the wrong assumption. And Micheline Flynn says, impetuous, Homeric. Did you guys mm-hmm. agree that this is what happens in the film? Yep, that's exactly what happens. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <clears throat> yeah, accurately described uh, what we watched. Yes. And then, in a scene that I didn't quite buy... John Wayne is planting roses and being romantic, and they're kind of back to liking each other. He takes a passive aggressive shot at her. I'm trying, yes, he does. What is it he says? She's like, she's like roses, no cabbage, no potatoes, and he's like, and no children, and no children. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, real passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah, but but they're sort of romantic in that scene yeah but he's i i just felt like he's sort of he's just trying to figure out the next thing i don't know i bought it because it wasn't like he was yeah they're like what's he supposed to do with himself he's supposed to what would you do i would be really pouty personally he's gonna go find something to do so he's gonna go dig around in the garden john wayne is just gonna turn over a garden he's got to find something some kind of work some kind of job i'd be angry i'd be like you made me sleep outside in a sleeping bag and then you wanted all our friends to think what a great time we had you suck. How do I get this thing annulled? <laughs> I ain't going to be planting no roses. But maybe I'm a worse man than John Wayne. Or maybe I'm a better one. I don't know. But I'm just saying. I, I thought he handled the whole thing remarkably well. <laughs> 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 Given what he was dealing with. He's playing the long game. He's playing the long game, yeah. You know, I'd buy it more if he was more of a John Wayne character. Like, like, like if you really, if the character of Sean Thornton really was just Mr. Kick the Door Down, there'd be no locks and keys between us. Like, if that was the whole arc of the character, then I'd buy it if he was Mr. McClintock. But this guy, I don't think, is quite that guy. No, he's trying well, to hold himself back from violence. Well, and... he's, you got to remember the scene that he gives you later, or maybe he's already given it at this point. I think it's later, though. Where he says, I don't know how to fight somebody unless I want to murder them. Right. Yeah. And so he's like talking about the guy that he killed. He's like, 
Everybody said it was within the sport and the game, but I'm telling you, I meant to kill him, and I did. And I, I don't know how to box. I don't know how to fight. I don't know how to do anything. And up to including I don't know how to fight with my woman without... Wanting to kill her. Wanting to kill her. So. And so it's on or off, and so it's off forever. Mm -hmm. Is like the demon that he's ostensibly battling. Right, F which is fair enough. So they go to town together. She runs off. Then they have sort of dual moments where they talk to wise old mentor characters. Clergy people. Cl clergy people. Clergymen. Yes, clergymen. <laughs> Cler clergy people, yeah. <laughs> she gets pretty thoroughly chastised by Father Lonergan. Tells him the whole story in whatever that language is called. Irish. Irish. Like, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'd he, like to, I thought about looking up a translation of that. Mm -hmm. It would be fun to know. It would be fun to know. A lot of those types of things end up being pretty spicy. I'm sure it was. I just have to assume. Father Lonegan <laughs> is not pleased because in Ireland, a man can expect to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sean goes and sees the Reverend Playfair, this dorky Anglican guy who... Wished that he was a boxer, or was a boxer. Was a boxer. Was yeah. a lightweight boxer. champ. They have a nice conversation where the guy provides nothing helpful besides it's a difficult situation, but I'm sure you'll beat the crap out of him. I mean, that's basically like we all know what's going to happen. I mean, he doesn't really say that, but he basically does. He's like, you'll yeah, figure it out like, in God's good time. And then, he, by the way, he has a strong right hook and a jaw of granite and all. This. And I'd offer you a drink, but you'd be tra you'll be training now. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like. Well, you're not escaping the ritual, Sean. Yeah, and then John Wayne goes back to the house, and Maureen O'Hara's there, and she's doing the whole submissive thing, and she's got a stick so he can beat her for the day's disobedience, but he's not that kind of guy. He throws the stick into the fire, I tell ya. And then she's, like, on her knees, and she's lighting his pipe, and it's all, like, that. It's that. Mm -hmm. And then... I think that they sleep together. They go to bed. Which I've heard people interpret the movie differently and say that they don't, but that's dumb. Really? They, of course they, they sleep together. They there. go into the room together, and then and the in John the morning, the very out. first thing that they very intentionally stage and show is him coming out. Right, with a big, dopey, docile smile on his face. Like, Yeah, and part of, part of the play later on is like, and, and she's disappeared, and it, there's that moment... I forget where it is, where it's basically like, oh, I don't know. She basically references it. Yeah. She basically says, I did the thing. Right. I, yeah. So they consummate their marriage. You'd think that maybe that would solve a lot of problems, but actually she's like, well, I love this guy. I really love this guy, but I just can't respect him. I don't want to be with him if he's going to be a stupid wimp that won't do our ridiculous rituals i love him too much to live with a man i'm ashamed of or whatever yep micheline reports but boy does she not have to be ashamed of him now because in the he gets a real kick out of reporting it yes micheline's there lots of people with their knows little, what's gonna happen yeah and, and so <laughs> we like, do, we go into the john fortius it is time it, john ford scene with all the little townspeople betting and <laughs> the music, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. He goes and he tracks her down. She's cowering in the train thing. He grabs her. He drags her across the country. He's kicking her and dragging her. The old lady comes up and says, here's a stick to beat the lovely lady. It's all very amusing. And then he throws her at the feet of her brother. He says, you owe me 350 whatever pounds, pounds yeah. and... I'm not paying, and then you take her, it's broken. And that's the that's the moment where she says, I forget what exactly she says, but basically after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She says, you do this. Uh, I actually have it here. She says, you'll do this to me, your own wife, after dot, dot, dot. Yeah. No cut, no fortune, no <laughs> marriage. We call it quits. So then Donna here is like, there's your dirty money. Throws it in his face. And she opens the threshing machine door, and Sean throws it in. And she's got her pride and got her position in society. Everything's happy. She goes back with a big smile on her face to make dinner. And then the Donnybrook begins. And they punch each other across the land of Ireland. Donna her sucker punches him. Yes. <laughs> Does that multiple times. The only way to maintain the reality that we have the heavyweight boxing champion of the world right. <laughs> here against some 
lump headed Irish old man. Mm. Well, that that plus the idea that John Wayne is holding back the whole time. So it's right. kill him. Well, yeah, which they definitely sell yeah. in the with the final knockout. Yep. He's uh. figuring out how to how to fight and hold back. How to have a gentleman's fight and not just kill the man. Right. <laughs> the rules of or what what are the Marcus Mar- Marcus Mar- of Queensbury. Marcus of Queensbury rules. I love the British guy in the pub who's just got his newspaper. <laughs> that's a nice that's a nice little, little detail. T- yeah. I'm not sure I'm all in on the old man literally coming back to life to watch the fight. That's a little cartoony, but most of the stuff I'm there for. <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> I like the archbishop. I don't know what Anglican hierarchy is exactly, but the bishop, the, bishop yeah, I think. The, the bishop and the the reverend betting on it and all that good stuff. And it turns out men just need to take the measure of each other. They just need to have a fight. Which I shouldn't say this sarcastically. This part does ring true. We have an old pastor in Bloomington that references this scene all the time as kind of a touchstone for how men are. Once you've fought with somebody, then you can really be friends with them. And it's true. It's It's true. It's true. But they take each other's measure. They're best friends. You can have a fight where you come away not best friends, but it's because the other guy fights dirty or you're taking each other's measure and one of you finds the other one wanting. Right. You know, it's just like. But if you're like, we're both willing to hold ground, we're also both willing to punch each other in the face, then. We're willing to look each other in the eye, hold our ground, punch each other in the face. And then help each other up so we can punch each other again. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be some level of fairness to the fight. It's a status fight. It's a gentleman's fight. It's a, this is very different. Than... Yeah. That is, and that is what you want. And I think in adult life, most of us do it with words, but that is absolutely what a man wants in another man. And you can be friends with somebody like that, and it is a good thing to be. So they've they've done it, and they come home, and he says, Woman of the house, I have brought the brother home to supper. And she says, he's kindly welcome. Done. Take off your shoes. Yeah, wipe your feet. <laughs> wipe your feet, there you go. <laughs> and then we have this ridiculous – I want to circle back and talk about the ending a little bit more, but we'll just finish up the movie. Is it Not ridiculous, I shouldn't say ridiculous. We have this really – arch stagey I, I love it i love it you see all the characters and they're like almost doing a curtain call like that's you, right you just all these shots of people standing kind of bye it's the end of the movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and then you have john wayne and marine o'hara and he's got the stick to beat the lovely lady but she grabs it and throws it away it's a, a marriage of equals whatever he's not going to dominate her and she whispers something i should read this last little part from marine's biography because people want to know <clears throat> no matter what part of the world I'm in, the question I'm always asked is, what did you whisper into John Wayne's ear at the end of The Quiet Man? It was John Ford's idea. It was the ending he wanted. I was told by Mr. Ford exactly what I was to say. At first, I refused. I said, no, I can't. I can't say that to Duke. But Mr. Ford wanted a very shocked reaction from Duke, and he said, I'm telling you, you are to say it. I had no choice, so I agreed, but with a catch. I'll say it on one condition, that it is never, ever repeated or revealed to anyone. So we made a deal. After the scene was over, we told Duke that our... Ab- about our agreement, and the three of us made a pact. There are those who claim they were told and know what I said. They don't and are lying. John Ford took it to his grave. So did Duke, and the answer will die with me. Curiosity about the whisper has become a great part of the Quiet Man legend. I have no doubt that as long as the film endures, so well the speculation. The Quiet Man meant so much to John Ford, John Wayne, and myself. I know it was their favorite picture, too. It bonded us as artists and friends in a way that happens, but once in a career, that little piece of The Quiet Man belongs to just us, and so I hope you'll understand as I answer, I'll never tell. So, (laughs) apparently it was something very dirty. But, I guess. But, Hmm. people have speculated. I don't think you can read her lips if you're a lip reader. I don't think it's angled such such that you could. So, yeah. But she whispers something that gets a big reaction. <clears throat> then they. What did you think? That what did I think she whispered? Yeah, I mean, before, like, did you have an impression or a thought or an idea? I just assumed it was we're a happily newlywed couple. Let's go back to the cottage, baby. That's what I did too. Yeah, because they kind of. I think I always. Yeah, I did not read it that way. This or this way this time, but I think I always imagined or had the idea that she was telling him she was pregnant. That could be. Huh. That makes sense. Cool. But that's the way I had always read it. It would make sense. That makes a lot of sense. It's sort of the cap. Right. Stone. Either way, it's a, we are a newly fertile, happy married couple. Yeah. I mean, that genuine shock, surprise reaction from him. Yeah. 
it's the clean way of we've been coming together now. And also that's actually his angle on it, Mm -hmm. you know, in the garden earlier and no children. Yeah. So that's how I read it. That's how I'd always read it. But yeah, well, so at least from the, that is almost certainly not what was actually said, but from the storytelling perspective, that's how I always read it in the context of the movie. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I like that read. Yep. Me too. (laughs) So here's my criticisms. I I love this movie. I think it's a great movie. It's a fun movie, but I do feel like you have a pretty serious culture, culture class story that's actually being told. That's being told. Well, you have, you have a really good movie that's going. And then as, as much as I love this ending, everybody loves this ending. Everyone who's not a scold likes this ending, but it's a lot of fun and I do not deny it, but it does feel like, okay, I guess, I guess that solves all the problems. Like all, all we needed to do was have a little morality play more, a little morality play. And I understand that's the entire point of the movie, but it does feel a little pat. It does feel like the scenes in the searchers where it's like Ethan Edwards is, this is such a serious grounded mythical sort of psychodrama and then we have these scenes of like the young man's falling in one young with the young lady and he's in a bath and she's bringing him stuff and he's like scrambling to cover himself it's like there's this really silly slapstick stuff alongside the serious iconic stuff that feels like it's rooted in like the epics of homer or something and and so this movie does have a, a a tonal shift that is wild like you have a story that you're pretty invested in and then it is just a silly ending. I just felt like it was the silly version of a serious ending. Just like, here's a fairy tale version of the actual thing where the man, like, okay, I'll meet you where I need to meet you to get you. But on the other hand, I'm going to do it on my terms. And everything, every part of it is going to be still me saying, yeah, I did what you wanted and I did it my way. And Well, that's my other question or criticism or whatever is, did he... Keep his self-respect. Mary Kate got what she wanted. She wanted a husband that would fight for her on her terms. But Mm -hmm. it turns out her desire for that ritual was more important than his moral fortitude, than the vow that he'd made. Her culture trumps. Like, he, she just... Hmm. Everybody always kind of thinks of this as, along with McClintock, the John Wayne puts Maureen O'Hara in her place movie. But despite some little throwaway jokes like here's a stick to beat the lovely lady i'm not convinced i don't think john wayne wins the battle of the sexes and i don't necessarily need john wayne to win the battle of the sexes you could say it's a good movie about maureen o'hara winning the battle of the sexes that's fine but i'm like man okay if i'm gonna take this story at all seriously like does sean still have his self-respect when this whole thing's done like he she forced his hand she's like sorry dude i'm running away i'm not gonna i refuse to be married to you and unless you do exactly what I want. And then sure, yeah, he does it in a way that feels kind of like she's he's putting her in, her, her in her place, I guess. But it's exactly the way that she wants him to do it. Marino O'Hara just wins. And I'm not sure that that would actually, like, maybe it's unfair for me to say, like, what happens after the movie? What's the actual moral, what's the actual relationship? Maybe I just have to take it as a ritual, as a, as a I, fun I don't movie. think it's fair, or unfair, sorry. Because I, I think it's, just the right natural question to ask. Mm. All right, folks. And this is where our timelines diverge because you are hearing all of one podcast that you think was recorded all at one time. And yet we just had something tragic happen, which is that our thingy ran out of space. I believe that's the technical term. Our thingy ran out of space. And so we stopped recording while in the midst of having this discussion about the most d- important discussion of the whole movie, actually. Mm-hmm. The most discussing, the most discussing <laughs> part of the whole portent. And so we can't exactly recreate that for you, but we can tell you what we said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we more or less basically kept circling around the question of did John Wayne end up, did Sean Thornton end up simply submitting to Maureen O'Hara's frame? Right. And. Here's a guy who killed a guy in the ring, does not want to fight this man. Has his own code, has his own principles, and basically ends up saying, eh, I want the girl, and so I will jump through her hoops in order 
to get her and I will punish her for it. Sure. But even that is kind of something that she wants. So she wants the catharsis of that. Can he have any real dignity and manhood behind closed doors moving forward from this point? Right. My argument is if you follow the actual, if you follow what the movie's actually telling you, the only thing that's left for him to have that dignity and manhood is for him to actually not throw away that stick, which of course I'm not in favor of as a human being. But the movie wants to say, you're going to play by all of her rules except for the one rule that empowers you. Empowers you. And it's like, eh, eh, that's not what any self-respecting do. Either either this guy's going to be completely whipped or since we've decided to play by all of her rules, he's going to play by her rules. And, and that means other things too. Yeah, and that means all kinds of things. If you're actually following the logic of the movie, if you're taking the movie as seriously as the movie takes itself in the second act, you kind of have to ask those questions and I and say, man, does does Sean emerge from this movie with any kind of self-respect at all and with any respect of his wife because in real life women always think they want their men to go and stand up to the boss go and stand up to the this go fight this guy go tell our neighbor off but at the end of the day what they really want is a man who can stand up to her right which is the one thing that sean can't do right in fact she does the classic woman move of i'm like the most high school thing like i'm leaving you I'm hopping a train. I'm getting out of here if you won't do what I say. Like she forces the issue and takes all the power into her hands. And then he basically says, okay, I will do what you say. I'm going to go get you. I'm going to drag you along so you can watch me go through your stupid little ritual and I'm going to punish you for it, which is a pretty beta thing to do if you want to walk out the actual logic. It's very beta and it's a real dynamic. I mean, that's, that's the thing. That's the reason why I don't want, quite <laughs> forgive the movie for it because it's like these couples exist. I mean, I would go so far as to say there are men that use the stick that do it because they're baited into it because it's what she wants. This is a real dynamic and it's not a dynamic that actually makes for a happy marriage. It's not a dynamic that yeah, makes it's not for, good or healthy makes for either couple, which is why the instinct of Ford like we said, either on or off mic at this point, who knows? But you have this moment that really tells. And the moment that really tells is, oh, she's being drug along. Oh, she's a wilted flower. You know, oh, she's tired. Oh, she can't make it. Oh, and he's not going to give the money. And this is the part of her script where he's just supposed, where John Wayne's character is supposed to just walk up and punch Donna her in the mouth. Mm hmm. And instead he says, now you take her. No marriage, no whatever. And that's when she's like suddenly snaps too. And is like, wait a minute, what? Right. And then the brother just sort of like solves so, the problem. Solves the problem. For so, him, solves yeah. the problem by throwing the money on the ground. And then we were back in her script. Right. But that moment of, instead of just going up and it's meant to empower him still or give him a little bit more mm-hmm. leverage, make it feel like it's a little bit more on his terms. Mm-hmm. Like, Maybe he really would have walked away if the money hadn't been thrown on the ground. Maybe he really wasn't playing her game. That's where it tries to to solve it. But I think the movie knows, Ford knows, everybody knows that if he responds and just follows the script right there and cold cocks her brother, it is all over. That's that's the one little moment that's supposed to provide enough covering and space for us to believe he didn't give up all of his his dignity and authority in that moment. But I don't know that it plays because it immediately jumps right back onto script and she knows what's next. He knows what's next. And so we're in the play. And so then it feels like, well, okay, this is just, there was a little bit of, there's a moment of improv here in the script right? where things could have gone off the rails, but they did not And it doesn't feel like he changed the script that he flipped the script that he made her live in his movie. Right. He just jumps Mm -hmm. right back into living in hers. Right. And the actual Maureen O'Hara's of the world want a John Wayne who can make them live in their movie. Like there, there actually is that element. It's what we actually do like and respond to about taming of the true stories. And people tend to think of this as one of them, but I don't think any fair reading of the movie actually makes it so. Well, and that's part of, I mean, we said this at the top too. One of the things that is very different about this movie and 
in Philadelphia's story and Catherine Hepburn's character and Marina Harris' character is that it is obvious Catherine Hepburn has no desire to be tamed. Right. And from the word go, Marina O'Hara is a shrew who wants to be tamed. Right. And she, the fact that she wants to be tamed, she wants to go through the ritual taming process is evident in throughout the entire movie Mm -hmm. from the word go. She wants the ritual taming process. She wants all the hoops, all the proprieties to be observed of a taming of the shrew story. And so then the question is, well, did she actually get tamed or did she end up taming her man? Well, and how many women do we know in the conservative reformed world who want the rituals of submission, the rituals of... It's the conservative reform world's rife with that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pandemic. There's a woman who controls her man by making him jump through the ritual hoops of taming her. And it's just like he's just as whipped as anybody, but... He gets to tell himself that he's done the thing while he's just sort of like following the script that she's constantly laying out for her. He's never actually led his home. Right. Now, I, maybe I can push back on, on all this a little bit and say, we also all know that that is part of the dance. Right. That one of the ways, one of the ways that, that, that is, it's what they say in that stupid <coughs> sitcom of a movie that people love. What is it that I'm going to be a snob about? My big fat Greek wedding, you know, the line, the husband is the head, but the woman is the neck that turns the head. Everybody loves that line from that movie. But, and it's true, right? Like women have an enormous amount of power and they wield an enormous amount of power by doing these sorts of things. And, and that's why it is a dance. And, and so they should. You want a wife who's making you feel like a man, but also getting a little bit of what she wants. It's just the dance. It's part of the dance. And so far as this movie kind of gets at that, like it is a match of equals and it is a dance and they have this ritual that they both have to do, but neither one of them really cares about the money. And insofar as we see Maureen O'Hara and John Wayne shining through the characters and just liking each other and enjoying each other, that's why the movie works and that's why mm-hmm. it's fun. And that's why it kind of works in spite of itself as the actual story of Sean Thornton and Mary Kate Donahue. I don't think it works at least not the way that the movie wants to tell you it does. And I think that's why he, uh, that's one of the reasons why the, it's helpful for the movies, what the movie is doing, that it has that really arch kind of curtain call at the end where. Yeah. What, what, you, what could have worked. And there are a couple of different ways that you said earlier that maybe the only real way for, Sean Thornton to play this out that stays true to without him losing his man is to actually let her go. Right. There is another way this works that I imagine could play. And that's if, but it's not going to play on screen, but it could play in real life. And that's if he proves without a shadow of a doubt and without any fun that the only reason he never fought her brother was that it was within his power to kill him (laughs) very quickly. And it was not a fair fight. And so, and he wasn't going to stoop to an unfair fight. Right. And so if he just turns around and mauls and massacres Danaher. Right. Danaher. Danaher. In a way that's just like, is this what you wanted? Did you want me to beat your brother to within an inch of his life? Is that really what you wanted? Do you want me to, and made her sit and watch it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Something like that, or on that level, there's a, a world that you could play with there, but... Yeah, yeah. And that makes a very something, different movie. Something on that level that makes the point, don't ever, when I draw a line, don't ever, when I draw a line, think that you have the right to make me cross it, because you don't know why I drew that line. Do you really want me to cross my own lines? Do you? You don't. And if he can do, if he can pull that off, mm-hmm. then maybe that changes it. Yeah, but there again, the one reason that you don't do that is because that guy doesn't throw away the stick. Like that guy, that guy has accepted about himself. Like, well, once I fight, I go for the kill. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know actually what the ending. I mean, you could have him just let himself get beat up, but but nobody wants to see that. Like if if we could go the other direction, he just lets Will Donaher beat the crap out of him. Just hold, has his hands tied behind his back the whole time. Again, it is one of those weird things where what we want from a John Wayne movie and what the characters need and want are actually two different things, and it's yeah. hard to make that work. 
Well, if you think about it from the standpoint of the Ir- the Ireland of it all, at least the, you know the fairy tale Ireland in the movie, then what's happening is Mickelin Flynn is is going to be the guy to announce to Sean that his wife has left him, and mm-hmm. and this is all part of the game. And the game is we this movie setting of Ireland, we're going to win, right? And we're going to tame the American, yeah. And the American is going to end up being absorbed, being assimilated. I think and, that's true. If it is a taming of anyone, it's the taming of the American. It's the, it's the taming of the American. It's the absorbing of the American. And you could even see reasons why John Ford might feel like, well, we don't want people to think that we just look down on the Irish. So this movie can't have the American winning over the Irish. Right. You could see that happening and being a part of the script and being like, no, well, we've got to have John Wayne still keep his manhood. So he gets some, he gets the moment of script flipping that doesn't really change the fact that ireland's going to win well and you can see from that vantage point why they want to have it both ways like yeah <laughs> oh yeah we're going to be irish but we'll throw away the stick like we don't have to take we can take the best of everything but that feels a little cheap to me like you don't in life you don't actually get the best of everything yeah uh, i'm not saying it's cheap i'm just trying to i'm just think trying to reverse engineer it like what is it what are they doing and maybe why that's one why one part of it possibly well, it is also interesting that so many people who love this movie do love it as a taming of the shrew movie. Like they really like all that stuff and think it's funny. And it's like, and sure, it's funny, but well, and that's because they want to read it as a parable of the inevitability of the patriarchy and stupid modern America, modern Am- American man. If he would just submit to the ethics of fairyland, mm-hmm. would find that he could have. Happy life, a happy home, a happy wife. Well, I hope those people won't think I'm being Tom Keller or Tom Keller, Tim Keller or something like that when I say I think he might have actually been more of a man if he hadn't fought Red Donaher. Like he didn't want to do it and he had his reasons and it would have been manly for him to stick to them. As much as we all like to see John Wayne punch people, and I like to see John punch people, Wayne punch people too. Well, if you want to say that the patriarchy won, you have to say which one. <laughs> yeah. John John Wayne's patriarchy didn't win. But there's an Irish patriarchy that you could say did win. Yeah. And they got they got the way they wanted it. They want their society a certain way. The men in a certain place, they got it. Yeah, well. Hmm. Is, uh, I don't know. Maybe we're not even criticizing. I think we are criticizing. But yeah, we are. <laughs> we're, we're also describing. Like it, is, it is part yeah. of what makes the movie interesting. It's, part, it's, the, it's the stuff that it's playing with. And maybe there's... None of these questions exist in McClintock. Oh, yeah. No, McClintock is just the... Uh, Tame the lady. Yeah, no, that is a taming of the shrew story. It is a taming of the shrew story. And in some ways... Straight up, straight ahead, and we know everybody loves it. Right. Yeah, McClintock is like a, you know you like it. Come on, come on. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, you know. We all like this. It kind of has that attitude. Here, sub the stick out. Yeah. Well, as I say many times, as I said many times, Monday we'll just have to do McClintock because it is a really fun, it's not a great movie, but it is a sure a fun one to talk about as far as like, what were they thinking and why? And what did, how did everyone take it and why? It's just crazy. But yes, it, it does almost feel like McClintock is like John Wayne did the quiet man for John Ford. And, but then he wanted to come along and say, well, actually this is how it would go down. Like, like actually there's no question of a match of equals or anything like that. Actually, (laughs) John Wayne wins everything. (laughs) And McClintock, I mean, apart from the spanking scene, like the whole movie is just idiots come up to John Wayne and they want to thwart his will somehow. And then he destroys them, whether it's with a line of dialogue, whether it's with a punch to the face, whether it's with a coal shovel to the bottom. (laughs) He, anyone who, comes against John Wayne and the patriarchy in America <laughs> loses. And it's fun. It's fun in a dad movie kind of a way, but maybe it even tracks in a very cartoonish, exaggerated way. Maybe we could argue it tracks better than this one. I don't know, but only cause it's way less ambitious, right? Like there's hmm. quiet man is a galaxies, a better movie than McClintock is. Uh, anything else to say about, Mm, this twee Irish fairy tale about an American who becomes assimilated into a terrible culture. <clears throat> well, if you want to reframe it in in storytelling in fairy tale terms, you have a a knight 
<clears throat> who's made a vow to never fight dragons mm-hmm. ever again. He goes, he wins the girl's heart. He refuses the call to fight the dragon. He actually gets her away from the dragon's castle. He just didn't take some treasure along with him. And then she shames him into going back to the castle, killing the dragon that he never fought. Other people fought. Maybe the real issue is that the townsfolk subverted, actually emasculated him from the beginning with their conspiracy. Yeah, that's interesting. Because he had no idea what happened. He wasn't going to go fight for her. He gave up. He was just going to go and aggressively ride his horse until he broke his neck or the horse's neck or whatever. Right. Father, what's his face says when our narrator just magically pops back on the screen right. or into the our mm-hmm. ears. He never goes and I, like he just sort of like it's like the townspeople steal the girl away from the castle from the from the tower. He's like, "Yay, you got away." Let's get married. And then she's like, yeah, but you should have actually killed the dragon. And hmm. yeah, that's interesting. Well, I think and, and, and it I shames think, him to, I, I don't know, it feels helpful to just let's reframe this in terms of types and archetypes. Then he's like, fine. After the fact, I will go back. I will fight the dragon and then I will throw the treasure into the lava or the moat or whatever. But this is all a meaningless, stupid, pointless ritual. And I hate that this is how it has to play out. I think that that tracks and makes sense. And the fact that that's all kind of embedded in there is why we respond positively to the movie, why we don't think too hard about it when we're watching it. But again, let me put a pin in your logic. (laughs) If I had successfully, for whatever reason, the princess had successfully gotten away from the dragon, we were living together. I had made a vow that for whatever reason, I didn't like what came out in me when I went and fought dragons. And then she's like, no, I'm running away from home unless you fight this dragon. I would not feel like the man of the house. I mean, I would feel subverted. I'd feel bad. And I might lose my self-respect even if I went and killed the dragon. Like, you say kill the dragon. It's like, well, of course it's good to kill the dragon. but Not if it's a useless dragon to kill. We already won the prize. Right. Yeah, Yeah. that's... I wasn't making an apology. I was no, you're describing, just describing the no, but I think story logic. Your words almost made an apology in and of themselves just because we like dragons we like to kiss and the logic of like of course you have to kill the dragon right and the movie's logic is of course you have to punch victor mcglaughlin it doesn't matter you could have made a vow to god you know we don't know what level vow he made but it's like you said you were never going to do this but victor mcglaughlin really must be there's, punched there's a higher law here right and the higher law is you don't get the bride unless you've punched the brother you and usually the these kinds unless of unless you fought the dragon and and the townspeople didn't have the right to take that away from you. Right. And so you have something that was stolen. You didn't steal it, but it was stolen for you. And so it's got to be paid for. Right. And the way that Hollywood usually subverts this when they have a pacifist character is what you do. And I don't know how this works in the logic of the actual movie, but what you do is you have Victor McLaughlin take her away. Like he ties her to the train track. He has to break his vow or she'll die. It's like the dragon grabs the princess and flies off. And then it's like, well, okay, it doesn't matter if I made a vow never to fight dragons. Now the dragon's got her. Well, and that's the part where it does break some because what she feels in the moment, he's already signed over the dowry. He signed on the dotted line. The dowry is sitting on the table and he goes and he takes it back. It's like, well, now he's stealing Mm-hmm. he's stealing from John Wayne and from John Wayne's wife. Right. And so that's a moment where a man has to stand up on some level. Yeah, I did feel that. And that's the, the part time. where he just sort of is like, yeah, screw it. Yeah. I, you know, I don't want it. Got what I want. Well, and if you look at and I think you can, I don't know, maybe you could talk yourself into saying it all tracks perfectly and we like it. Be, if, you, if you look at it really from her perspective, and it's like, if this is a fairy tale, he... He stole the magical diadem that keeps me alive. Like he took something that was primal to my wifehood, to my womanhood, to my independence, to like, like he took, he took me like, like it is the, like from Maureen O'Hara's perspective or from Mary Kate Donahue's perspective, I am still trapped in the cave with the dragon. Like there is something right. so fundamental that you tied up with mm-hmm. my identity in the, well, in the but stupid that would money. have been the furniture, and that's they gave that up, right? Like the furniture actually would have been something to fight for, right? Because it's her, 
it's her family heritage going back generations. It's her mother's, grandmother's, great-grandmother's things that was always supposed to be hers and was always supposed to be something she could hand down to her kids. And that's different than some banknotes. But she does talk about both that way, if I recall. She talks about the banknotes the same, along the same lines. I can't remember the piece of dialogue. Yeah, it's just hard for me not to agree with John Wayne that the one, it's good, it makes sense. Like, you, it's irreplaceable, but the other one really is just money. But I agree with you. She sees them both. She sees them way. both. And then she also sees that he gave up his self respect in some sense when he refused to fight. And so she's holding that against him. Yeah. <sighs> and she doesn't understand why. And he won't tell her. And he won't tell her. Yeah, which is a dumb movie conceit. I mean, in real life, what actually happens is they talk about it, I hope, and then they can come up with some kind of plan together. And who knows what that plan is. But step one, hey, I don't want to fight your brother because I killed a guy and I feel really bad about it and I vowed not to fight. And that's just as important and to me. I'm afraid if I fight again, I'll do the same thing. <laughs> right. And guess what? I don't want to kill your brother. And guess what? You don't want me to either. Yep. Try talking, John Wayne. The name of the movie is The Quiet, the quiet Man. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> you goober. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I mean, you just get the Anglican priest to go show everybody the stupid, do me a solid, dude, and let everybody know. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. The way the story is told, Mary-Kate Donahue may well never know why her husband was a wimp well, who didn't and, want to fight her you know, And the priest himself, the Anglican priest, should feel some degree of responsibility to be like, well, Donaher, you're actually you're picking a fight with a with a a raging bull who has agreed to lo keep himself under lock and key, and so there are two things going on here. You can go and slap him and make yourself look and feel like a big man all you want, but it's really weak of you, and you're also playing with fire. Because at any moment, that bull might just decide to break out of the pen he's kept himself in. And so how about you just chill out? <laughs> how about you just recognize, read the room, recognize the situation here? Because if the whole townspeople, if I go and tell the whole townspeople that this is a heavyweight prize fighter who's killed a man in the ring, who's vowed to never fight anyone ever again, then you look suddenly really, really small. And nobody's going to believe that he can't take you. And you're just going to look like you're beating up on somebody who... Yeah, that's true. Although I could see if you were the Reverend Playfair, I could see myself saying, uh, well, you're going to waste your time telling Red Donaher that? <laughs> right, yeah. He's, he's an idiot. He's not going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> he's literally... You remember the cop that's chasing the guy in Safety Last? Yeah. The, yeah. That's, that's, oh, yeah. That's the level that Red Donaher has played as. He's just uh -huh. like this big, goofy brawling snarling idiot although he does get a chance with the widow to lane at the end no patty fingers if you please it's very cute all right well any anything else to say about the quiet man benjamin no or jacob nope ben how many sticks to beat the lovely lady obviously you only have one but uh, i don't know what you're trying to say here <laughs> You don't know how many sticks I have. Okay, that's true. You may have a whole closet full. <laughs> a man has to keep his self respect. Me Megan's whole dowry was just a big box of sticks. sticks. Just don't tell Megan about the sticks, okay? <laughs> but I have to keep my self respect. So. <laughs> she doesn't know about them. You're just like, <laughs> I've got those sticks to beat the lovely lady if I ever need them. <laughs> Let me keep my self respect, my self -respect closet. <laughs> Folks, Ben does not really have a closet full of sticks to beat a lovely lady that he's too afraid to use. <laughs> he uses them all the time. <laughs> all right. So how many out of 50 sticks to beat the lovely lady, how many do you give to I, I'm honestly quietness? not sure after this discussion because I'm rethinking my enjoyment of the movie. So let's just say, let's say 35 for now. 35. Okay. And Jake, how many sticks to beat the lovely lady out of 50? Out of 50? Mm-hmm. 40. 40. Okay. I'm going to give it 45. I mean, I really... I was the one that started it, that pulled on the thread that made us question everything. But I really like the movie. It's really enjoyable. It's beautiful to look at. The cinematography is beautiful. The romance between Wayne and O'Hara is crackling. The scene in the cemetery, the scene when he gets mm -hmm. home and they sit in the chair silently. 
together. I mean, and she lights a cigarette, all that stuff. John Ford is really good at that kind of stuff. Much more comfortable with sexuality than his, the uh, what do you call the person that comes after the person? Then, then Spielberg. Oh, yeah. Ever, mm-hmm. Spielberg sucks. I mean, you think about the scenes in Indiana Jones. It's like the, the one black mark on the Indiana Jones trilogy is all the bad love scenes that are just lame and awkward and stupid and crude. And John Ford wouldn't have had that problem. I tell you, I tell you. So I really like this movie a lot. I just don't know whether it's actually, well, that actually works as a story about real people. And I wish that it did because the first two thirds work really well, I think as a story about real people. And then it suddenly turns into a John Wayne movie and doesn't try and put all those things together in a way that actually makes sense. But I'll give it, but as an experience, I'll give it 45 sticks to beat the lovely lady. And speaking of lovely ladies, Seth is not (laughs) one. He's a lovely man. And he's our Patron Choice Award of Awesomeness winner. Now, what is it that makes Seth such a great dude? (laughs) Seth would not let himself be, Seth would not let himself be uh, subverted like that in his own home. That's right. Yep. He'd keep order. He'd keep the stick. Mm -hmm. His wife threw the stick away. He'd be like, you just threw it a few feet away. I'm going to pick it up. Now, what did you, what, what did you, what did you think you were even accomplishing? Yeah, there's a whole world full of sticks. There's That's a lot of sticks. Door. It's a lot of yeah. sticks. Okay, good for Seth. He's a wife beater, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I nah. didn't say that. It's all a metaphor. Yeah, no, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Yep. <laughs> Anything dicey that we like in a movie is a metaphor. McClintock is all big, one big metaphor for something or other. Okay. We love Seth. We thank you for we thank him for his patronage. He's a good fellow to have on a Discord. I'll tell you that much. And the Quiet Man. I will. I think we would all agree if someone has never seen the Quiet Man, it is Definitely a it is one to yep. seek out. Even if you have more problems than we have with it, then I think you'll still it's still just worth seeing and talking about and enjoying. Uh, well. That's all she wrote, folks. So until next time. Impetuous. Oh, man.